do that? Lisa, can you pull up your presentation? Jessica, can you see the presentation? Can everyone see the PowerPoint? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Now we're ready. Thank you. Okay, we're ready for a roll call. Yes, sir. All right, Ms. Davis. I'm here. Okay, Ms. Karpinek. I think Ms. Karpinek's gonna be here a little bit later. Uh, Mr. Pepper's here. Mr. Taylor's not here. Mr. Lawless. Yes, sir. Yes. Mr. Newton. I'm here. Okay, so that I believe gives us a forum. The um, first order of business is we need to, um, I'm gonna make a mo motion that we hold this meeting electronically under the circumstances. Seconded. Is any board member opposed to that motion? Okay, that motion will pass. The um, we because Mr. Pepper, of, sorry, yes. this is this is Alex Dickerson with Metro Legal. Can I ask that you do a roll call vote for each of these? And and if if I could restate the motion just so we have all the formalities taken care of. The motion is that the proposed agenda constitutes essential business of this body and that meeting electronically is necessary for the health, safety, and well-being of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, that's the motion. Is there a second? And can we add that's Chinese it. coronavirus to it? And yes. Okay, that's the second, Mr. Lawless. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, and so we'll vote. Uh, Ms. Davis, how do you vote? In favor. Okay, I vote in favor. Mr. Lawless, how do you vote? In favor. And Mr. Newton? In favor. Okay, that motion passes. The next motion that I need to make is uh, we're going to have to suspend the rules based on the circumstances that we can, none of us can be in the same place because of the the pandemic, and so uh, the way we way we have discussed having this meeting is, and the way we're set up to do it technologically, is to allow uh, people that are speaking for or against an application to call in, and that's the only way they'll be able to speak. And each person, my motion will be that each person who calls in, uh, whether they're for or against, has only two minutes to speak. The applicant will be allowed five minutes at the beginning uh, before we take calls uh, either in support or in opposition. The applicant will be allowed five minutes, up to five minutes. Then we will take, we will hear from supporters and opponents, and then the applicant can have another uh, five minutes or the balance of their time. So um, I will make a motion that we suspend our normal rules and conduct this meeting according to that procedure. Is second. there a second? Second. Okay, Mr. Lawless is seconded. I'll take a roll call vote. Ms. Davis, are you for or against that motion? I'm for. Okay, uh, Mr. Pepper is for. Uh, Mr. Lawless? In favor. Mr. Newton? In favor. Okay, that motion passes. I will proceed now with the introduction for today's board meeting. In order to convene this meeting pursuant to Executive Order 65, board members are participating remotely and we're encour encouraging members of the public to submit comments in support or opposition to the board electronically at bza at nashville.gov. We extended the deadline to submit comments and any comments received by 12 o'clock noon yesterday, Wednesday, December 16th, were provided to the board for consideration prior to this hearing. 
Additionally, members of the public can call 629-255-1903 to provide comments in support or opposition to any case called on today's docket. We ask that you wait until the case is introduced prior to placing your call. The same telephone number, 629-255-1903, will be used to call in for any of the cases on today's docket. Today's meeting for the Metropolitan Board of Zoning Appeals is now in session for a regularly scheduled meeting of December 17, 2020. My name is Lisa Minton, and I will be presenting the cases to the board for the review in today's hearing. For these hearings, the board reviews the correspondence submitted in support of and opposition to these cases. The board also reviews correspondence and recommendations from other government agencies in preparation for today's hearings. In today's hearings, the staff will present the site plans, maps, photographs, and other documents that comprise the case record. At the conclusion of the staff presentation, the appellant will present his or her case to the board. After the appellant's presentation, we will allow anyone wishing to speak in support of or opposition to the case to call into the meeting. And to restate the time limitations due to our electronic proceedings today, the appellant will have five minutes for their presentation. Anyone calling in to provide public input will be given two minutes to speak. The appellant will then have any time remaining from their initial five minutes, as well as an additional five minutes for rebuttal for a total of 10 minutes. At the conclusion of each hearing, the board will deliberate and then vote on that case. The board is vested by the power to act on these cases under the provisions of the Metro Zoning Code, section 174180. All section numbers that we refer to come from the Metro Zoning Code, which applies to the entire jurisdiction of the metropolitan government. The Zoning Code was adopted by the Metro Council and became effective on January 1st, 1998. I will introduce the entire zoning code and make it part of today's record. The Metro Zoning Code requires a record of these proceedings. Because the meetings are recorded for Metro National Network, it is imperative that anyone addressing the board should identify themselves by name and address then make their desired presentation. The Metro Code requires four members of our seven-member board to establish quorum. The code also requires at least four affirmative votes to grant an appeal. In the event that five or more members are present, but the appeal fails to receive four affirmative votes, the case will remain on the board's agenda for the next 30 days. Applications that fail to receive four affirmative votes within 30 days of the public hearing shall be deemed denied by operation of law. Pursuant to board rules, an aggrieved party may appeal board decisions to chancery or circuit court within 60 days of the entry of the BZA order. Additionally, as per the BZA rules, an aggrieved party may file a motion for rehearing by the BZA within 60 days of the original hearing date. After that time elapses, the board's decision becomes final and no further action can be taken. If your appeal is granted, you are required to obtain that permit for which you applied. A permit must be obtained within two years for a board approval to remain valid. It should also be noted that if false or misleading testimony is presented to the board, any board approval could be revoked at a later time by means of a show cause hearing before the BZA. Mr. Vice Chairman, I submit that all cases have been filed in proper order, all appellants have been notified by certified mail, and all legal notice requirements have been fulfilled. Thank you. Um, are we ready to call our first case? Mr. Vice Chairman, I do have a preliminary announcement concerning a withdrawal. Okay, Case 2020-259 20, for 1018 Monroe Street, it has been deferred to the February 4th meeting. That's 259. Yes, sir. And the other announcement is that we, before we move on with the cases to be heard, we'd like to take this opportunity to allow any elected officials to call into the board meeting at this time. Let's give it a, um, about 30 seconds or so to see if we start to get phone calls in. It sounds like we are. We'll patch someone through once we get them answered.
Are we having any calls? We are. Council members about to come on and speak. Okay, great. We have Council Member Sean Parker on. Uh, Council Member Parker, can you hear us? Yes, uh, Board Member, this is Council Member Parker. Can y'all hear me all right? Board Member, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Yeah, Council Member Parker, we, we can't hear you. Okay, great. Um, so, thank y'all for, um, for being here this afternoon. Uh, I've got three cases in my district um, that are to be heard today. Um, case 2020219 at uh, 338 East Trinity Lane. Um, we've, we've had some back and forth with the appellant um, since the last hearing on this case. Um, there are some conditions which I believe um, Lisa Minton is aware of, um, which have allowed me to um, uh, reach a degree of comfort with this appeal. And um, as, um, other folks who were concerned about it are fully satisfied, but um, if the conditions that I believe Lisa is aware of are um, included, uh, in the board's decision, then, then I'm all right with um, 219 moving forward. Um, there's case 2020 uh, Council Member Parker, what was, excuse me, what was the first case you were referring to? Because I could not hear what number you were referring to. You're, you're not coming through very clearly at all. Mm. Okay, so the first case I referred to was case 219, um, okay. 338 East Trinity Lane. Okay, you can, and you're, you are support, you're in support of that application? Um, given if, if the conditions which uh, myself and the appellant and Lisa Minton have discussed are included, um, then, then yes, I'm supportive of that one moving forward. And, and what are those conditions? Um, well, the, the most important one I think to me is the um, uh, no short-term rental at the property. And I believe the appellant and his client have agreed to that condition. Okay, and any other conditions that you recall? Or, or um, it, the, in addition to the northernmost unit, they've agreed to increase the setback on that from five to 10 foot um, in order to maintain the sight line at that intersection. Is that, do you know, do you know how many units that is? Uh, uh, we, we can ask the appellant, that's fine. It's only one unit that they've agreed to move the setback on, and it's the northernmost unit. Um, okay. It's six total at the, at the at what they're proposing. Um, and um, is there, is, is, did y'all copy that? Yes. Thank you. Vice Chair, this is Lisa Minton. There are six units at the development, and the condition was that unit number one at the corner would be at a 10 foot setback and the rest of the proposed development would be allowed a five foot street setback along Lucy Avenue. Okay, I got it. And then council, uh, councilman, what was the next case? Can you give us the case number so we're all make sure we can all get there? Yes, sir. Um, next case is 2020-234. Okay. 234, this is on a 
Um, and, and it, you know, the board packet is no longer available, so I don't know um, exactly if there's been opposition submitted, but, you know, absent um, substantial opposition, I'm, I'm just fine with whatever the board decides on that case. Um, and the third and last case that is in my district on the agenda today is 2020252. Let's okay. hear 252 at 1220 North 5th Street. Um, this is um, mostly a um, uh, uh, variance request for um, the, the step back and the build to. It's a 25% variance request. Um, I, I think this is probably a little bit too intense for that site. Um, there's considerable opposition from immediate neighbors, and I would ask that the board either deny or defer this request today. Okay, are there any others, council members, that you need to tell us about? No, sir. Um, thank you. Okay, well, thank you for calling in. Thank you. We do not, we have not had any other council members call in. Okay. Are we ready to call the first case? We are. The first, the first case to be heard today is case 2020-075, located at 5670 Granny White Pike. Here's a parcel map view of the existing parcel where the existing church is located. They're seeking a variance request to locate two digital ground signs on the parcel. The aerial view of the property, street view. These are the views from both Granny White Pike and the adjacent street, Old Hickory Boulevard. Here's a site plan provided by the applicant showing the proposed location for the signs and the proposed elevation of the signs. At this point, uh, the applicant can address the board. We would like to make sure that you please state your name and address and present your case at this time. The board, my name is Tom White, 315 Dedrick Street. Our law firm represents the applicant of Bethel in this case. Uh, I'll comment at the front end that we turned in a position paper in this matter back on March 12 of 2020. It's been deferred a number of times because of some of the COVID matters, which this board is totally familiar with. But basically, uh, this is the church relying on the Religious Freedom and Restoration Act uh, which basically justifies this unless there's some compelling governmental interest for it not to take place. Uh, the church has been in this site since 1989 and has been well known and recognized in the community. Uh, although the property is currently R40 zoning, as indicated in the slides that were just shown by staff, there's almost 900 feet of frontage along Old Hickory Boulevard, which is directly across from the commercial business area, period. Uh, as this board knows and has on a number of occasions dealt with uh, RIFRA, it is particularly strong and far more uh, lenient for religious uses than the RLUPA or the Federal Act. In this case, there has to be uh, an, a curtailment of religious motivated practice is protected by the statute. In this case, the church is talking about constructing two relatively small digital signs. They're basically used to announce religious services and other religious motivated activities, as well as directional signs into the church. With respect to uh, the key issues under RIFRA, we've mentioned that uh, as opposed to the federal enactment under RIFRA, the government bears the burden of proof and persuasion. Uh, and they must demonstrate not only the ordinance makes rational sense, but it's essential and compelling governmental interest not to allow the two signs here in question. That's in my opinion, a burden that cannot be overcome. Again, the government 
must show a compelling governmental interest uh, which would prohibit the signs in this case. I cited in our brief uh, the most recent Tennessee Court of Appeals decision, which members of this board may be familiar with, uh, basically the Ward versus Metro Board of Zoning Appeals. We're not inciting that case uh, with respect to total control, but it's absolutely clear in that case, this was a matter in Davidson County against this same Board of Zoning Appeals where there was a request to do about 20 small houses on a church piece of property for transitional housing. Uh, this case was decided in our Chancery Court, went to the Court of Appeals. In that case, the Court of Appeals felt there was no compelling governmental interest that would disallow these 20 homes being used for a church purpose, i.e. transitional housing. Our case is far less uh, requiring. We're requesting the ability to place uh, two relatively small signs in an area where there's an adjacent commercial district. Uh, it's obviously clear in our opinion that it's controlled and compelling by RIFRA, uh, the state enactment, which this board is familiar with and the board was named in that board's case. I'd like for just a moment to introduce uh, JT, who is a representative of the church and will take another 60 seconds on that. Thank you. Appellant, this is your two minute warning. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your time. My name is JT McCraw and I'm the ministry, uh, director of ministries uh, at Bethel World Outreach. I've been there for a number of years, 25 years to be exact. Uh, I just wanted to state the importance of this sign for us, uh, it being informational. That's not only informational for our church, but informational for the community as well, for things going on that they could be involved in, such as a food drive, blood drive, things that we've done to support our community, uh, as well as directional. Uh, when people come onto the property, that we could uh, direct them where they need to go for such things. Uh, I, I do want to state uh, that out of respect for this board, uh, we did not ask any of our 2,500 members to call during this during this meeting for time's sake, including my time's sake. So I appreciate uh, each one of you guys, and uh, thank you so much. We appreciate the commitment by each of the board members to participate. It's obviously a different presentation, and I've been down in front of the board within the last 30 days or so where it's different, even if there's only two people in the room at a time. So it's a, a new experience, but we appreciate the public commitment, and we are extremely sensitive to making sure that the congregants, a great number of who live in this councilmanic district, uh, have been asked not to contact in. So we appreciate your courtesies. We respectfully ask that it's controlling by RIFRA and should clearly be approved. Thank you for your courtesies. Uh, thank you, Mr. White. Uh, do any uh, board members have any questions for Mr. White? If you do, if you can indicate by uh, putting your hand up in the... I don't see any. Mr. White, I have a couple questions. Can you hear me okay? This is Vice Chairman Pepper. Yes, sir. So how would the, how, if the church were not allowed to put up these digital signs, uh, how would that inhibit or curtail, curtail their uh, ability to exercise their religion? Basically concurrent uh, with the religious practice are the signs that indicate the different times for the services, uh, the different events that take place in the old days uh, chairman of having bulletins are basically old days. Uh, now these digital signs will give the information about the times of services, what things have changed, and especially during these COVID times, it's extremely important to be able to communicate. So the messages from the church are on these boards uh, with respect to times, meetings. They're also directional. Uh, this is a Granny White, Old Hercule Boulevard intersection, uh, and these signs would clearly be, in our opinion, totally consistent with the practices. And again, with the burden on the government uh, to show that there's a compelling reason not to allow them, I don't see how much argument can be raised in opposition. <clears throat> well, I understand that that's that inform that what you want to do is get information out, but what does that really have to do with the practice of religion? Well, the whole guts of religion is a communication of a gospel message. Uh, and in this particular case, uh, it helps with the information that spread as part of the message. I mean, basically the whole 
purpose of a church is to communicate a message, whether Christian or otherwise. And in this case, the proclamation of that message, including times of services, in our opinion, is absolutely totally germane and, and a, a pivotal part of any church to be able to communicate with the public, not just during regular times, but especially during COVID times. Hard, hard for me to believe that someone wouldn't think a sign for a church, and there's a number of them around town, as we know, are not pivotal and instrumental uh, to a religious uh, practice. Uh, and again, as I said, with the burden of proof on government to show that there's not a compelling reason for that, I think it's relatively clear what the law would require in my respectful opinion. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. White. Uh, Mr. Newton has his hand up. Mr. Newton, you have a question for Mr. White. I do, um, and, and it is for the for the uh, gentleman of the church as well. I mean, what what have you done? I know we've received obviously a, a, a multitude of letters in opposition to this. And if you drive down Graining White Pike, there's it's dotted with signs all along. It's you know in, in opposition. You know what what have you done to work with the community to make this amicable for all? Uh, <clears throat> respectfully, uh, uh, we've not done anything that we have not gotten opposition to, so this is nothing new for us. Uh, and in the past, we've taken the time to uh, have community meetings. We've invited the community to, uh, to see what we were going to do, and that was much on a much larger scale as far as when we built the building. Um, we just didn't see it necessary at this point for a simple sign to go through that process and specifically and especially during COVID. I know that people are uncomfortable gathering. So we tried to limit that as much as possible outside of our Sunday services, uh, which we just now started again. So again, respectfully, we're, we're kind of used to people opposing anything that, that we do. So Plus, I want to make the comment, I've done work for this church over many decades. They've never failed to have people over to the church for conversations about it. If you will notice, uh, when we first started into this matter and we first turned in our position paper, it was March 12, very telling. Uh, that was our position paper and it was um, almost immediately at the beginning of COVID. Uh, and again, we have not uh, ever failed uh, to involve community here and there's a significant number of the congregants that live in this district. So we have reached out, but we have to uh, affirm, as JT just said, we have not had any meetings at the campus, uh, and that's been very clear for the reasons I've mentioned. And I will add one thing. Um, our, we're a public, uh, and we're open at any time, that any time a neighbor wants to come ask, obviously we're, we're there on a daily basis. And I have spoken to several neighbors, neighbors uh, with whom I know and have a relationship with, and they did ask what we were doing and were comfortable with what we were doing after uh, explaining what it was. And, and I do want to comment, we have had no inquiries. We've made it clear to the staff that if matters came to their attention, and we've made this in writing and orally uh, to the staff, that those should be referenced to us and we would answer any questions. I have had no contacts at this office, and I know John Michael is not there today, but he can confirm to you no one has called there to ask to reach out to me or the church. Okay, uh, any other questions from the uh, from board members? Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. White. We'll now, we, and board members, there'll be some pausing here while people call in. Mr. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I, I had my little hand up. I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Laws overlooked you. I apologize. That's all right. My wife does that to me all the time anyway, <laughs> so uh, I, I felt right at home. But I, I think this, I was looking, and Lisa, could you, do we have what the dimensions or the locations of the sign are going to be so I can ask Mr. White a few questions? Okay. All right, Mr. White, I noticed that um, the former city attorney of Forest Hills forwarded a letter in opposition by the mayor of Forest Hills. I assume the church is located either adjacent or around the city of Forest Hills. Is that correct? 
Mr. Lawless is located right on the border of Forest Hills. And I don't know that we have ever had a matter come before the BZA, all of which have been approved, where we didn't have opposition from Forest Hills. Right. Um, well, I just, and I guess for disclosure purposes, I guess I should say that, that the former city attorney for Forest Hills, I don't know if he still represents Forest Hills, is now the city attorney for Oak Hill, where... I serve as the municipal judge, so I guess I do need to to disclose that. I don't think that's a disqualifier um, because it does not affect that particular entity. But I'm a little concerned. Has there been a study done that indicates whether the, the brightness of them, are they going to be illuminated and flashing messages? Chairman, I don't know whether or not, uh, Tom, you want to answer that or if the, the member of the church wants to. I'm, I'm just. Uh, if you, if with your consent, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Wallace, I'm going to let JT answer that question. That's more than fine. I'm just trying to get information, guys. Sure. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, no, uh, we don't intend on using them as flashing signs. We can, the, the whole reason for going with an LED uh, screen is the quick, uh, quick, the time that it takes to change a message. Uh, okay. if in, the, in the old days, uh, before we did the building, we had one of the signs that you had to go out and actually change each letter. Um, and that was cumbersome. Uh, and we just, we built within the technology of the church when we did the building uh, with this in mind, uh, that one day hopefully we can do this. So really it's the time that it takes it's the obviously the led is a much prettier picture that we can put up and you can put any graphic up that you want so it's more pleasing uh than just letters uh but no 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 flashing fireworks uh going off during july 4th or anything like that would, would it be similar to what's say going on in on franklin road or pike whichever you want to call it with some of those signs that are along there uh, I'm not very familiar, but I would, is that, are you talking about, it's talking about like uh, Justin, Hills. Justin Hills? Uh, yeah, yeah, those types. Like yeah. Informations, lettering. Probably not uh, that big. Probably not that big. I think they have a pretty large sign. But we would not have any problem in a condition that would prohibit flashing signs. That's sure. something we well, and, and I'm trying to think of the amount of, of just how bright it is. Um, <clears throat> And whether it's distracting in the evening or something like that, I, I you know, have, well, there's, has there's there been any consideration of of limiting the hours that the sign will be out there putting out a message? Uh, I would again, this is JT McCraw. Sorry, uh, I mean it would be similar to Brentwood Hills Church of Christ. They have a sign that's got uh, it's an LED sign. That has hey this friday you know this is coming up uh i, I don't think limit, limiting our ability to put out our message uh as long as it's not distracting i, I absolutely agree and that's why we designed the sign the way that we did in the first place uh is that it's kind of the least distracting as possible uh it's not again we're not here to be a nuisance we're here to give out our information of what's going on in the church that serves the community and and our goal is definitely not to be a nuisance to that. There's another very similar one at the Judson Baptist Church, which we're looking at, uh, exact same message board, yeah. uh, et cetera. It'd be no different than those two we just referenced. Okay. Thank you, Mr. White, for that comment. Um, okay. Okay, uh, before before we move to Mr. Newton, who has his hand up, Mr. Lawless, for some reason, I've got a little icon in the corner of my screen, so I will not be able to tell when you have your hand up. So you'll just have to kind of uh, remind me uh, verbally when you when you have your hand up, if you could do that. It would be uh, more than my pleasure to badger <laughs> you, Mr. Chair. I know you will not be bashful about it. Uh, Mr. Newton, you have a question? 
I do. And this, this may be more for, uh, uh, for code staff. Can you kind of, I know there, there are some regulations on in terms of flashing or in terms of moving things, uh, within the sign ordinance, even if this passes, can you, can you, can, can we get a brief explanation of what those are? Uh, cause I, I think that might address some of the concerns that some of the community members had regarding these signs. This is Lisa Minton. Um, under the prohibitive, prohibited sign section of code 1732-050, um, it talks about signs within 10 feet of public right-of-way or 100 feet of a traffic control lights that contain red or green lights that might be confused with traffic control lights are prohibited. Um, signs that are of such intensity or brilliance as to cause glare or impair the vision of any motorist, cyclist, or pedestrian using or entering a public way. Um, basically, it doesn't go into detail as far as lumens and things like that, um, but it, it directly um, describes situations that might distract the driver. Okay. Does that help? Thank you. Yeah, that does. But would this would this be within that uh, within that uh, distance? No. no. Yeah, these are outside of that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Newton. This is Joey Hargis. Let me let me also add one other section um, for you in seventeen thirty two oh fifty G. It talks about that signs with gra uh, copy or graphics or digital displays. Um, do not, uh, they have to remain fixed or status, static or motionless for a period of at least eight seconds uh, before the next graphic comes on screen. And Mr. Hargis, do you know, does it, does it uh, prohibit like scrolling or like moving uh, animation between, between uh, messages? Yes, sir. The, the sign code does pro prohibit that. Okay. That's what I thought. Okay. Thanks. Okay, there appear to be no further questions from board members. Uh, so we'll have to be patient here while we take calls um, from people that want to speak in opposition or for this application. Okay, we already have some in the queue. We're about, tra about to transfer one through. Okay, great. Hi, my name is Jimmy Lynn Ramsour. I'm calling on behalf of myself and my husband, Alan Ramsour. We live at 1417 Beddington Park, which is just off of Granny White. First, let me be clear. There are signs already at the Bethel World Center uh, which uh, talk about programs they're going to have and services they're going to have. So the reliance on RIFRA is misplaced. This is not an interference with their exercise of their religious practice in any way. There are plenty of churches across Davidson County in neighborhoods, as this one is, that do not have lighted LED signs, and yet they announce the nature of their services and when they're going to be. Um, this should be, this, uh, Bethel should be held to the same standard as other churches within neighborhoods across Davidson County. Judson Baptist is on a state highway. This is at the corner of Old Hickory and Granny White. It is not a state highway such as the one that Judson Baptist is on. Again, we're not, um, this is not a commercial area. There are, there's light commercial and that there's an office building across the street, but there's another church, Caddy Corner, which also has a sign announcing its services and it's not LED. The LED is unnecessary. It's offensive to the character of the neighborhood, and we oppose it. Okay, uh, does anyone have questions for Ms. Ms. Ramsour? Okay, Ms. Ramsour, thank you very much for calling in. Thank you. Do we have other callers in the queue? 
We uh, we do. We're about okay. to transfer one through. M Mr. Pepper, this is Mr. Newton. Yeah. Uh, can I ask for clarification from maybe code staff or, uh, or others? Uh, is Old Hickory Boulevard, I believe that is a state highway. Can someone confirm that, please? Lisa or Joey, are you ready to put, or should we put yeah, Mr. Newton. Mr. Newton, one second, if you'll give me a moment or two, I'll, I'll look that up and, and, and chime back Sounds in here. Good. Yeah, yeah. We, we can wait until after the next person. I just, wanted to, I just wanted to make sure I understood that. Okay, call, you're, call you're ready to speak. Thank you. My name is Marshall Alden. I'm an attorney in Nashville, Tennessee, with Parker Lawrence Cantwell Smith. We represent the city of Fort Hill and have submitted a, a letter from the mayor of Fort Hill and a supplement this week uh, from our office. And we are we are in opposition to this. The first thing we would note is the test is whether the uh, Denial of the sign. I understand it has been denied. So it's not allowed. Mr. Albert, Mr. Albert, this is Mr. Pepper. We're, we're not hearing you very clearly. Hello? Mr. Albert, we're not hearing you very clearly. You're coming through. Uh, not clear. Are you in a bad spot? Oh, okay. Can you hear this better? Yes, that's much better. Okay. Uh, so my understanding is that the the Metro code disallows these signs and that this sign is, these signs have been disallowed and this is an appeal. And so it's on the basis of a variance and on the basis of the religious uh, protection laws. First, with respect to uh, a variance, these signs are detrimental to the public welfare and uh, they are directly across the street from Forest Hills residents. They do not fit the character of the area there are no digital display signs on granny white or even this section of old hickory boulevard these internally illuminated digital signs are very bright they're glaring and uh they're, they're just they do not fit the character of, of the neighborhood and so it's obnoxious to people who live in the area uh so it, it, it would not be appropriate for a variance then with respect to the uh religious first the first thing that one needs to show is that there's a substantial burden of religious exercise. And there, uh, that has not been demonstrated here. These signs that have uh, letters, you, you can make them of various sizes and they can contain the very same messages. In fact, the Forest Hills United Methodist Church, which is almost adjacent to this property, has such a sign that can be illuminated, but it is not an internally digital, digitally illuminated sign, and so you don't have the same glare and the same intrusion on the public. Uh, there is a case interpreting the law. Uh, Mr. Al Mr. Albritton, uh, Mr. Pepper, your, your time is up. Okay, thank you. We, we appreciate you calling in. Thank you, bye-bye. Do we have other callers in the queue still? We do. We have one okay. more. They're going to patch them through in just a second. Okay. Thank you. Caller, you can speak now. This is Cal Holland. Can you state your address, please, sir? Yes, my um, address is 918 Dorset Drive in Nashville, Tennessee. We're the community at Dorset Park right next to the Bethel Church property. Thank you. 
And I'm speaking on behalf of myself, and I'm the HOA president for our subdivision, so I'm speaking on behalf of every uh, every home in the subdivision. And we definitely oppose this request. Um, our thoughts are, one, there's five other churches within close proximity to this church. None of those churches have LED signs. Uh, you look at Maryland Farms, huge, hundreds of office complexes, buildings, no LED signs. Uh, there's no other LED sign that's community even across the street from this church. No businesses, no LED signs. We do feel like it would be a distraction to drivers coming through there. It's a very busy intersection right now, and to have a sign with flashing information would be distracting. I find it really interesting in today's world of everything being online. What we're doing is it should be on-sign for communication, and we know it's not on-sign communication. It's online communication. Anybody, COVID or not COVID, so I think that argument is very weak. Uh, I will say that uh, the statement was made that Bethel has never failed to involve the community uh, in changes, and they cannot say that again because they have failed to involve the community in this. Uh, so, morning. And so it's frustrating for us as neighbors every few months. They put for some other change, some other zoning, and we just ask you to deny this request and encourage them to honor the neighbors and just abide by the regulations that are in place right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holland. Thank you. <clears throat> Do we have any other callers in the queue? We do. Actually, our next caller is Council Member uh, Henderson. Okay. We're going to patch. Mr. Chairman, just before you take Council Member Henderson's uh, call, I, I spoke to Public Works, Bonnie Crumbie, and this stretch of Old Hickory is a state highway. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Hargis. Okay, we're ready for you, Council Member Henderson. Thank you, uh, board members. This is Councilwoman Angie Henderson. Um, my TV is muted, so I'm not sure if you uh, can hear me. Um, but I wanted to, uh, just for the record, uh, bring your attention to my letter, which will be in your packet. And also, after listening today, I wanted to make uh, some additional points. Um, I, I do want to share that I have received zero contact and support of this appeal uh, from constituents. Um, have received uh, numerous uh, calls and emails in, in opposition, as, as I know you have as a board as well. Um, regarding the, uh, the, the practice of a uh, religious mission, um, I, I would remind the board um, that the location, um, uh, the, the time of services and otherwise, there are now uh, available uh, to congregations, numerous avenues uh, to uh, convey the same email, social media, um, online uh, website, and otherwise. Thus, that does not make LED signage uh, specifically uh, necessary. Um, I would also bring your attention uh, to the residential character of the surrounding area. While Mr. White did speak to some uh, commercial across the street. It is a uh, light commercial, uh, low scale office, um, catty corner, a uh, church uh, without LED signage, and then all around uh, residential zoning. This is the JA to Davidson County. Um, uh, Rudy White is a historic pike. Old Hickory Boulevard from this point on is a scenic uh, state route. Um, what I will say as well, um, I have heard a lot of input from constituents and concur having experienced it myself, um, have also conferred with TDOT about it. Uh, this uh, intersection um, is, has very tight uh, turning radius. It is in our GSD. Uh, it is uh, fairly uh, dark comparative to other areas. And um, uh, having any sort of visual distraction um, in this vicinity is not safe for the community. One has to observe very closely where one's bumper is when making a turn um, uh, on uh, Grady White Pike, um, uh, facing in the direction of the signage. Very, very close, such that bumpers almost touch. Um, it is something that PDOT is aware of and, and likewise finds um, concerning, and I have conferred with them uh, about that. Uh, the National Institute of Health the American Psychological Association 
uh, with their report driven to distraction, um, have all um, uh, uh, pointed out that uh, light emitting diodes, um, the brightness, the contrast the driver has when operating in a dark area, as is the PSD, thus looking at something as bright as light emitting diode signage, that that then renders um, uh, the driver, uh, it, it gives them an, a momentary impairment. Um, that is not um, uh, uh, safe at, at this intersection. I, I feel that very strongly, and um, I just wanted to then register my adamant opposition uh, to LED signage. Um, at this location. Thank you. Thank you, Council Members. Do we have any we other have. calls in the queue? We do. We'll pass okay. one through now. All right. Thank you. Am I on? Yes, ma'am. If you could state your name and address, please. Yes, thank you. My name is Patty Zonick. I reside at 412 Oakley Hill, which is north of the uh, intersection with Bethel World Outreach Center. I am president of the Hounds Run Homeowners Association. Um, although we are north, we are very dependent upon this historical corridor, which is two lanes, as you probably know, and um, very uh, protective of the Radnor uh, wildlife area as well. Uh, along with other callers, I would just like to emphasize the strong opposition of the 100 residents in this community. That's 100 home sites many other residents in the area that are dependent upon this intersection. The church historically has um, had other methods by which they could get out their message and practice their religion. And we respect everyone's religion, their religious freedom, but we do not see the need to further introduce commercial grade lighting into this community where no other exists. The church across uh, the intersection of Green and White Pike has uplit lighting that is very consistent with the residences in the community. There are no LED signs in the commercial property that has been referenced um, by the church um, attorneys across the street. Um, there's just nothing like that here, and it's going to be an introduction of a... We have 30 seconds remaining. Thank you. Uh, the introduction of signage that doesn't exist here will be a distraction. Thank you for your service. We appreciate it. Thank you, ma'am. Do we have other callers? We do not. Okay. Let's give it, let's give it just a second. To sure. See if one I think we're good. Okay, and what uh, what is the balance of the time remaining for the appellant? 34 seconds. Okay, uh, I have questions, so uh, is Mr. White available? I am, uh, Chairman, and I did want to clarify, understand the remaining 34 seconds will obviously answer whatever questions, but in addition, I appropriate uh, governance was there would be five additional minutes if asked for. Am I wrong about that? That's correct. You have five minutes and 34 seconds. Excuse me. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I heard 34 seconds too, Mr. White. So, or yeah, we, sorry. but you have, you, have, you have five minutes and 34 seconds. Thank you. So, Mr. White, if I could start with a question, this is Mr. Pepper. What what evidence is there that the information that the church wants to put on these signs, which I assume will be directional or inspirational or informational, informational about meetings or get-togethers? I mean, what evidence is there that this information is not available to church members through other means? 
I would like to ask Mr. McCraw to answer that, if you would, please. I think it's basic information that every church puts out on some type of outside uh, messaging, but Mr. McGraw can answer that better than I. Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, yeah, it is uh, for the community, not just our members. We're a growing church, we continually grow. So it's not just for our members, uh, but the things that we do for the community, such as we've got a food drive during the week. Uh, we have divorce care, we have grief share, we have um, addiction things that we host at the church. So a multiplicity of things that go on either at the church or on a Zoom call. Uh, it's, it's just impossible to have that many signs uh, up on our property to tell uh, our community and our people what we do on a weekly basis. But but all that information you could put on the internet, correct? Well, sure. Like every church and like every business, the internet is a source of uh, information sharing, but it does not exclude that of a sign. All right. And then, so, Mr. White, I have a question for you. As I understand, RIFRA, it applies to uh, any ordinance or enactment that would inhibit or curtail the religious exercise of church members. And if these messages are designed essentially for the public at large, how, how could it possibly be inhibiting or curtailing the ability of the members of that particular church to exercise their religion? What I hear is that it might inhibit their ability to have another platform for messaging to the community. Yeah, I'll answer it real quick. Uh, our community uh, is not going to go typically to our website to find out what we're doing unless they see something first that directs them to it. For instance, if someone's going through divorce and they see on our sign that we have a divorce care, then maybe they would go to our website and figure out what that is. And I would say that's for any anything that we do to help our community during this time. And, and I want to add, obviously, the messaging is not just for the members of this congregation. The, the whole message, whatever the religious denomination is, is to get their message out, not just to their congregation, but to basically all that they can reach out to. So it's a dual purpose. There's a number of people that would never think about looking at a website for this church uh, or something on the computer that might drive right. down, see something about divorce or addiction, et cetera, and restore so, Mr. White, uh, I'm sorry, but let me ask you this. Why then, if, if under this inhibitor curtail standard, based on the argument you're making, why wouldn't the church be allowed to put up a sign that was uh, 500 feet tall and 30 feet wide so people on I-65 could see it? Well, that's, that's the standard. That's the standard I hear that you're arguing for, which is that if, if the church can't put its message out, then they're being inhibited or curtailed. So what would stop them from putting a sign like that up and arguing that, that they were being inhibited and curtailed? Well, basically every case has to use some common sense uh, and suggesting that they would do this 500 foot tall to be seen by the interstate obviously would not be deemed reasonable. There's always a reasonable uh, aspect in all of these matters. And in this particular case, uh, as we've demonstrated, there's other of these digital signs up and down Franklin Road that have been there for some time. Same type of message, same simple. None of those have been exaggerated. These are not exaggerated. They're relatively small signs. Uh, and so my comment, Mr. Pepper, is that everything has to be based upon a reasonable uh, standard. And the question is, is this a reasonable proposal? Uh, it's hard to say it's not when you consider the others that are doing this same thing and have for years. And as I said, the, the burden is on government to say that this specific proposal, out of 500 foot high visible by the interstate, this specific proposal is or is not reasonable, number one. Number two, is there a compelling, let's think about this, a compelling governmental interest why this should not be approved with the burden of proof being on government? I don't see how anybody can argue that, frankly. Well, isn't the government's interest in, in zoning and regulating property a compelling government interest? Isn't that why we have zoning? You do, but in this case, RIFRA, in my opinion, controls. Uh, there are a number of things that would not take place uh, were it not for certain protections. Uh, this is one of them. And as I said, in the obviously, you're a practicing attorney. You're aware, uh, at least, of the comments that were made by this court of appeals case against this same board of zoning appeals where think about the same argument. There's 20 small houses being proposed on a church piece of property 
for transitional housing for people that have got addiction problems to be there until they're able to get back into a more regular form of society. The Court of Appeals said there was no compelling government interest in stopping that. How okay. could even Wait, Mr. White, may I interject real quick? Quick question, Mr. Pepper, if, with your permission. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Okay, uh, Mr. White, I, I heard the council member for this district say, and I also heard Mr. Hargis say that the the flashing signs, the coloration and what have you can distract or affect people at a, a busy intersection. I think I alluded to at night, sometimes those of us like you and I in our age bracket, you know, we, we sometimes can be easily distracted or at least I can. Um, what that would be a compelling interest for the, the health and safety of the general folks around there, would it not? I don't think so. I mean, the bottom okay. line. I, I, I understand we can agree to disagree. Um, and one other question that I've got, and then I'll be quiet, and, and it, I'm listening to, and obviously it's a heavy lift on for, for public to get on board with something, but it sounds like there, this is more of a contentious neighborhood fight than it is almost anything else. Can you explain to me why the Bethel World Outreach Church seems to have such strong opposition because they always want to do something contrary to what the folks in the neighborhood want to do? Um, I mean, I'm just trying to understand, um, and you're doing a good job, don't get me wrong, I'm just, and, and you know I always tell you when you got a hard sell, and you've got a real hard sell with at least one member of this board that's talking to you right now, um, yeah, I know the burden is on the, is on the government, but um, the burden's on you to convince me, and I haven't been real terribly convinced, Tom. Well, let me do the very best I can to say, first of all, you also a practicing attorney uh, and the Ward case, the Court of Appeals ruled that 20 transitional homes were appropriate uh, and it sided with the Board of Zoning Appeals. Also opposed vigorously by the neighborhood. And in that case, vigorously, far more than this, vigorously opposed by the neighborhood. And frankly, if you were being objective for a whole lot more credible reasons, 20 tiny houses as they were to house transitional folks that are going from drug or other related backgrounds till they were able to move on to a more permanent residence is obviously overwhelming with respect to what would be concerned by the public. And there was tremendous public opposition here. So you also are a practicing attorney. The Court of Appeals said, despite the huge neighborhood opposition there, uh, that there was not a compelling government interest. Now, I want to talk about this specific case. I have represented Bethel for a number of years on matters. And there, frankly, are some neighbors there as far away and in uh, places, Hounds Run, we heard the representative there, that would prefer that there not be a church at this location. This started as the Lord's Chapel more than 30 years ago. Uh, and there have been people... Yeah, actually, I think it was probably closer to 40 or 45. I remember when they built the Lord's Chapel. That's so, a scary thought. It is a long time, <laughs> but, but I do want to make this comment, Mr. Lawless, and that is, with respect to the law, I don't think anybody can disagree that the law would support the request here. And the other item you keep saying, you know, what are the reasons why the neighbors are opposed? At the end of the day, I fully understand why people that live in a residence close by may not want a church on the property, may not want a sign on the property, uh, our clients would commit the temporary signage that we've got right now, we would take down. It's a matter of basically putting up a more appropriate signage, which we showed on Judson and the other ones in the area, that's more appropriate today. But I do want to be very clear in trying to urge you for your support in this matter, that with respect to the law, it's very, very clear. And the fact that there's neighborhood opposition to it, I'm sorry for that. I've never had a matter out there where they haven't had a number of meetings there at the church with every council person that's ever been out there. And in this particular case, we could not do that because of COVID, 
but there's been no lack of events at that campus that are not oriented towards this neighborhood and the community as a whole. So I- okay. I'm Tom, sorry. Tom, can, Tom, explain to me this. What is the burden that's being put on the church by saying they can't have this digital sign when they could put on the signage that's there right now, see our events by visiting our webpage at www whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, if you look at the signage up and down Franklin Road on other churches, uh, which has been approved and is clearly appropriate, and to my knowledge has not been objected to, we have- Actually, actually, Tom, they have been because I was on the BZA for Oak Hill when those were coming in and they were pretty strongly restricted. I'm very appreciative that you supported them and they were approved when you were in that position. And, and I will say in this particular matter, we face 800 feet uh, on Old Hickory Boulevard. It might be called light commercial, but if you remember on some of the comments that were made today, that Old Hickory Boulevard is not a state road. That's why Franklin's different. That's not correct. It is a state road. That's not controlling. It's just a factor. And so I, I just would urge you on, you've sat on Board of Zoning Appeals for many years, probably longer than anybody else on this group, not just here, but in other cities. And, and my comment is neighborhood opposition uh, is clearly not the hallmark here. There is neighborhood opposition. I respect Council Lady Henderson. I've known her for a long time. I've known some of the other people that called in, these four or five people today. I respect them. I have every right for them to object to it. But with respect to the messaging for a church, there is a total communication issue here. And who can disagree that a, a temporary sign where it's static is any kind of substitute for these digital signs? That's exactly what these message boards are about on these other churches, and they've been effective. So we're asking for what, in my opinion, is a very reasonable signage, uh, two locations, attractive signage, uh, as Mr. Harvey said, there's real restrictions on how long they can be there. The lightage can be controlled, so they're not confused with a red light there at the intersection. Uh, I mean, to me, if you look at the distance of these two signs, one Granny White, one Old Hickory Boulevard from the intersection, I really find it hard to believe that somebody would say that this could be a distraction that could be a traffic issue. I just don't think that has any merit. But again, it's not our burden. It's government's burden to show that there's not that there is a quote a compelling reason not to do that. I just respectfully submit to you, I think the law is very clear based on not just RIFRA language itself. Forget the Ward case. Look at the RIFRA language itself that says there has to be a compelling governmental reason not to do it. Number two, that with respect to the burden of proof, it's on government. I just respect Yeah, but Mr. Mr. White, this is Mr. Pumper, but you're you're but you, the church has the burden in the first instance to prove that um, if it weren't allowed to use these signs, it's the, the religious exercise of its members would somehow be inhibited or curtailed. That's that's the very first step. And, and I think that's the one that, the, that it, I, I'm struggling with, and it sounds like at least one other board member is struggling with, too. And, and I think, too, you're the – I do think, as you – you're always very – forthright in explaining the law to this board. And um, I, I think you are right that there is a reasonable, reasonable standard to to this. And, and and to me, that brings into play what the the neighbor, the neighbors, how they react to this and, and whether they feel it's reasonable or not. And, and I respectfully would submit that every court case, every land use case that I'm aware of and have been involved with, every single one of them, uh, from Father Ryan forward, every one of them have said that the opinions generally of neighbors on issues like this without some expert testimony are really not particularly controlling. With all respect, that's what those cases say. And in this particular matter, I have to confess, Mr. Pepper, that there are a number of neighbors that are opposed to it. I understand that. And on the other hand, how can it be any clearer than the Ward case, which we've talked about, where the opposition to this is pick a unit compared to the huge opposition to those 20 transitional houses on that property. And so the same question asked now could have been and was asked then. And our Court of Appeals in a unanimous decision said what I have. So I understand there's opposition. I just respectfully ask this board to honor the law 
on the matter of is the messaging important, nobody can indicate whether you're a lawyer or a doctor or a church. Messaging is important. But the important thing here is that RIFRA under the Tennessee law is so much more controlling uh, and allows religious uh, purposes far more than the RLUPA under the federal. And in this case, I'm still saying who would argue that putting out a message for a church for times for not just worship, but for counseling, for divorce care, for addiction, why is that not something we all should be totally supportive of on these two innocuous ground signs uh, that are digital, can't be flashing, we'd commit to that, even if there's a color commitment, we would consider that. We're not interested in being a Christmas tree out there. We're willing to adhere to reasonable conditions. But to say that we have not given the board some reason to support that this is a good messaging, I frankly uh, have a hard time understanding, Mr. Perry. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. White. Do, do uh, Mr. Thank Wallace, you, I, yes. If I can interrupt, um, Mr. Or Tom White has three minutes remaining, but we also have two people on the line that would like to speak. Okay, and Mr. White, I'm sorry, I didn't know you had time left. So do you want to, um, uh, why don't you finish out your three minutes, Mr. White, and then we'll take the calls. If it's okay, Mr. Pepper, can we let them call? This is supposed to be a rebuttal. There might be Sure. Some. Yeah, do you, you want to reserve it for rebuttal? Please, sir. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, okay, so we'll take the calls now, and, and board members, there'll probably be a little bit of the delay here, so. Okay, caller, you can speak now. Maria Holland, I live at 918 Dorset Drive and am directly behind Bethel Church. Okay, thank you, ma'am. We can hear you. Okay, thank you, and thank you for hearing me today. I just, as a person that's lived in this neighborhood for um, several years now, I have found that um, Bethel has definitely used its religious liberties rights, and I'm a religious person, and I'm all about it, but they've taken it to every level possible, and they're not good neighbors. They haven't been good neighbors, and I called in mainly because they said they've involved the community in every day. We've had to go over there at night at 1030 at night because our house literally was shaking from the loud music going on at a youth rally inside their building. So I just want to point out that that's the kind of church that they've been in our community that have not been concerned about our neighbors. These LED signs that go up, it is true. Everything that's been said is very dark. It's very distracting. It's a bad intersection. There's lots of wrecks on that intersection. And um, it, it's going to be a problem if it's up. It, it sets a precedent of something that's not in the area. So they're taking it beyond what the law actually allows or the intention of the law for this. They're, they're pushing it in every way they can, like they push everything that they do. And I just, I just want the council people to hear that <laughs> from a neighbor that lived by this and lived by the activities that go on. I'm a realtor. It will affect the properties located right behind it because LED signs are... Um, bright and flashing. People don't like that. I'm um, also of the opinion as a realtor, signs don't necessarily help you get your message. <laughs> people are interested uh, online these days, texting, all sorts of media, and that's how people get their messages out. I'm directly opposed to Bethel. I'm directly opposed to their message. I'm directly opposed to the way they go about things, and I need you to hear that. So thank you. Thank you. And do we have another caller in the queue? We do. Just give us a second. All right. Caller, you're ready to speak now. Hello? Yes, ma'am, if you would state your name and your address, please, and then you will have two minutes. Okay. It is, are you ready for me now? 
Yes, if you'd state your name and address first. Okay, it's Victoria Lubnick, 901 Dorset. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, you've got two minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm calling, I live on the corner of Dorset and Granny White, and I am a mom of two um, little kids. And so we, we ride our bike um, on Granny White, and I am worried from a safety perspective of the sign. They are going to be a distraction. It is a very busy intersection today. Um, we have to use the utmost caution when we're doing any family bike rides on Granny White. And I worry about the additional distraction, um, especially given what the church was stating about the number of different activities and groups they want to advertise on the sign. Um, that's going to be flashing, and you're going to have to wait and watch the signs multiple times to be able to actually get through the information to get any um, adequate details about the groups you're looking for. And I just worry about the additional distraction, um, and it is a, a risk for the community that lives right here. Um, I, I take a little pause, too, with the fact of they weren't able to reach out to their neighbors because of COVID. The first appeal meeting was scheduled originally for March, and I don't think anyone ever heard from Bethel Church, or they didn't ever reach out about a conversation. Um, that would have been nice to be able to actually have them approach us from a neighborly perspective. Um, want to be part of the neighborhood, then um, why don't you try to be a part of the neighborhood and also maybe look at extending your sidewalk. Again, going back to the family bike ride, your property doesn't have a sidewalk in that little area. You have to ride into the street to get to the additional sidewalk. Um, all for supporting faith and religion and community. I just don't think it's a great precedent to set for the community and for the safety perspective of your neighbors who live right next to you. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for calling in. We don't have any more callers. Okay, uh, Mr. White, you've got three minutes left. I'm doing. Thank you, Mr. Pepper. Um, first of all, I will make the comment: the temporary signs that are now up will clearly come down. That would be part of our request. Secondly, there are significant other churches in this same area, two of which we've mentioned, that have signs extremely similar to what we're talking about. Uh, next, with respect to uh, the comment about the state highway, that this is totally different here because it's not a state highway, it is a state highway. Uh, with respect to uh, the issue about uh, the number of people and the, and the congregants that we've got, I hope this board will respect. We've got 2,500 members in this congregation. It would have taken virtually nothing for us to light up this board all afternoon with two minute calls. We've not done that because in my opinion, this is a straight up legal issue. Uh, but I have to comment when something is mentioned about people that live in the area, as far and as nice as a place as Hounds Run is, it's not directly affected here. But we have purposefully made sure that we did not inundate this board with calls. That's not what this matters about. It's not a popularity contest. If it was, we would win hands down and done that today. So it's a straight up legal issue. I respectfully submit to you that if this board will consider, and you can ask legal counsel that's there, you can ask about this ward case, which is in my opinion, clearly a very clear indicia of where the Court of Appeals says this matter is. There's several lawyers on this board. I think it's that clear. I don't know what the argument was about. Wait a minute, Mr. White, Mr. White, can I, can I at least caution you on one thing right now when you, when you reference some of the lawyers that are on here? And there's some great lawyers on this board that I'm honored to sit with. But if I remember correctly, and I looked it up while we've been sitting here, the Supreme Court denied cert on this case and marked the opinion not for citation. And if I, and I may be wrong, and you'll correct me, I know, but Supreme Court Rule 4E1 says that if it's got that type of designation, you can't rely on it. So the Court of Appeals opinion isn't necessarily a controlling opinion. At least that's my interpretation of it. Now, I may be wrong. So it's got no presidential value for us. And that's, that's a, a good catchphrase. So I just wanted to, if you want to address that, because that's going to be part of my discussion when we go off the public side of it. Um, and we have the board talking, and, and I just mentioned that. So you, you might want to address that for me. 
I want to correct you. That's exactly what the Supreme Court said. It doesn't change the fact that the decision was made or the facts of the case. The facts that I've cited are exactly what took place. And my comment was it would be at least instructive to consider that. I'm very much aware in citing briefings at different matters, especially at the Court of Appeals, that they would not rely on that as determinative. But it doesn't change the fact, Tom, that the facts in that case are exactly what I've said, and nobody's proved those facts. That's my comment about the Supreme Court comment, period. We okay. got that for many years, but it does not change the facts or make it less instructive. It may not be controlling. Certainly, this board would want to at least be aware of it. Well, Mr. White, this is Mr. Pepper, and I'm, I'm familiar with that case, but to me, you, you keep referencing that there, to me, what's going on here today in that case are apples and oranges, because in that case, what that would have prevented the church from actually bringing people onto its premises um, and and not a, a, a disallowing signs is, is not, to me, is qualitatively totally different. Well, Mr. Pepper, let me say this. If you're talking about something that would be offensive to a neighborhood group, surely nobody's going to argue that 20 tiny homes with transitional people with addiction problems is going to be anywhere close, anywhere close to putting up two signs at two entranceways to this church. Now, how could anybody say, I understand your facts and your comments, but you know what was done on that site here in Nashville, and my comment is, I fully understand if you're saying they were inviting people to come onto the site, if that's a good thing, then I think the neighbors probably might have a disagreement with you about whether or not they think that is less offensive than two signs that basically draw people to attend services or help at certain times. So surely nobody on this board is going to feel like the building of 20 transitional tiny houses for people with those type of unfortunate circumstances is going to be better received by neighbors than two signs of this sort? No, but that's not my point. That That's not what, I, I, to me, it goes to inhibiting or curtailing the right of the members to practice their religion. And in that case, you had a, the members of that church would have been prevented from having people come onto their premises. And there's nothing like that going on here. I, I agree with you that I think most people would find it more intrusive and offensive to have uh, tiny homes put up. That's not what I'm driving at. What I'm driving at is I think that case is different because, um, because of this inhibit or curtail factor. So, well, I, th I think you're exactly right. It is apples and oranges because it is far more offensive uh, to have what took place in the Ward case than what we're talking about. There's absolutely no comparison. And if bringing people to the campus is something that assuages your logic, then I want to argue what was said by J.T. McGraw here and that one of our clear purposes is to get a message to people that don't normally come to the church, that churches to outreach to basically not the immediate congregants, but to other people. So reaching out to others, Mr. Pepper, I would say is clearly part of the message that we're talking about here. It's well, I agree with I agree with that, Mr. White, but there's there's by disallowing the signs, it will not prevent this church from bringing people onto its church property for whatever purposes it deems appropriate and allowable. So that's that's what I was driving in. Well, the, the church is called Bethel World Outreach. Uh, they reach out to the immediate neighborhood. They reach out to the state. They reach out, in their opinion, to the nation and the world. Uh, and my, my respectful comment, Mr. Pepper, is that having a message board out there can't help but allow some people to become aware of services that otherwise they would never be aware of. But, and, I, and I don't disagree with you at all about that, Mr. White. I, I'm with you on that. I just, so, um, okay, thank you for answering that. Yep. That, I think that's the end of my time. I respectfully appreciate the courtesies of the board and would suggest just in closing that we've tried not to make this uh, a number of people calling in, which I've said twice already, which would have been so obvious to the board of getting public support was the criterion. Second, I respectfully submit that it is, in my opinion, a legally controlled issue and that we've carried the appropriateness of showing the RIFRA compliance by this church
and there's been no compelling governmental interest shown with the burden put upon government to indicate it's not. So thank you for your courtesies. Uh, uh, Mr. White, thank you, and thank you for the material that you submitted. They were very good, as always, and, and, and thank you for uh, thinking of our time and not having the church members call in. I will say we did, in our package, we were all aware that there were a bunch, a whole bunch of church members that supported this, so that is in the record. So thank you, Mr. White. Thank you for your courtesies. Okay, so um, let's close the public. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming nobody else had any questions for Mr. White. Okay, so we'll close the public hearing and discuss. Uh, again, Mr. Wallace, if you, you're going to have to butt in here because I have a little icon thing going and I can't see when you raise your hand. So. Well, I forgot to pull my hand down. Uh, a little bit earlier, so I, I'm, I, I'm, okay. I'm still going to go back. I will say this. I'm going to go back to the comment that I, the message can still get out. I am I just respectfully disagree with Mr. White this time. I think he did an incredibly good job, but I, you know, government, you got an awful lot of people against it, and government is supposed to represent the people so when you've got the council member who actually made health and safety issues that were compelling to me this time so um, i'll leave it to you mr chairman to let some other folks get in there sure okay uh thank you mr wallace mr newton you want to, you have your hand up i do i do I, you know i i respect i I can, I feel, I feel the plight of the, the church. I certainly understand it. And, you know, I, you know, I, I know, I know this is a common thing from working with churches um, a good bit. This is a common thing that they deal with. Uh, and my, even, you know, uh, and I, I would, I would be more of the opinion probably that it, that it is to some degree part of their, uh, their, creedal doctrinal you know um purpose is to is to uh connect with people outside of their congregation um are there other ways to do that yes but there's you know there's other ways to do just about anything you know i and frankly you know i, I i'm torn on this because i i do see I do see the plot of the church. I also see the plot of the neighborhood, and I would not want it, you know, if it was right down the street from my house, or you know. And I, I know this this corner well, and, and Granny White Pike is, I don't think is appropriate for it, uh, frankly. I have a little bit harder of a time seeing that Old Hickory is not appropriate for this. Um, uh, so, I mean, I, I would be more of a position to support the sign on old hickory but not on granny white uh granny white pike and and i think there would be need to be some some conditions there as well um with the fact maybe maybe something about only having a black background uh at, you know at, at night or um i you know i don't know if there's things we can do with that to make conditions to make it so that's not a uh traffic hazard uh uh and that's you know also understanding that there's some within the sign ordinance about you no know, scrolling and, and it has to be there for eight seconds, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, but I will, uh, I'll, I'll listen to what other people have to say. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Newton. Well, this is Mr. Pepper and I, um, uh, I, I, to me, the church has to prove, I mean, Mr. White is, is spot on about the fact that at some point, the burden shifts to the government to prove a compelling governmental interest, but before the, that burden shifts to the government, the church has to show that not having these signs would inhibit under RIFR would inhibit or curtail the bill, the ability of its members to exercise their religion. And and I and I think as Mr. Uh, White forthrightly uh, allowed, there is a reasonable reasonable standard there. I mean, you can't. It, there is some limit to it, and especially given the technology we have today, 
I just don't see how it, 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 it at all inhibits or curtails the ability of the members of this church to exercise their religion. Uh, I just don't see it. The I don't think we're inhibiting or curtailing them by not allowing them to, to broadcast messages out to the public however they want to. I think they're, the, the focus is on is their ability as church members to practice their their religion inhibited, and and I don't see it. I also think if if in fact their uh, religious rights were inhibited or curtailed, there is a compelling governmental interest, both from uh, a safety perspective, uh, as Mr. Laws I think honed in on, uh, and because there is a compelling governmental interest in in uh, zoning areas and uh, uh, having neighbors be able to rest assured that if they're in a particularly zoned area, they don't have to worry about um, certain uses that, that aren't allowable. So um, I, I, you know, I, I can't support the, the, the uh, church's application on this. So that's, that's where I am. Anyone else? Any other board members? Mr. Hi, Mr. Chair. Pepper. This is Ashanti. Oh, hey, Ms. Davis. How are hey. you? I just, How are you? I didn't see your hand up either. Let me see. Okay. I didn't raise it. I'm sorry. Okay. I just was listening and didn't raise it. Um, I'm sort of where Mr. Newton is on this. Um, I know that this is a hard one, and I think we've heard both good arguments for and against this. And I think you and Mr. Lawless have done a really good job of like fleshing out the other side of the legal argument. But I, from what I gathered from Mr. White's argument was that sort of reaching to other people outside of their congregation and within their congregation, which is the purpose of this sign, is a part of their religious practice. And so I'm sort of where Mr. Newton is because I also see the safety concerns at this intersection um, and that it's sort of sandwiched between these two neighborhoods. Um, and so how that might, the traffic and the lighting and how that might be a problem and have a negative impact on the neighborhood. I also see the argument where this is a part of their religious practice. Like it curtails it in the sense that they're trying to reach people with this sign and by not having some sort of sign that sort of inhibits their ability to do that, which is a part of their religious practice. Um, so that I'm sort of struggling with that one, but I do understand why you and Mr. Lawless view it the way that you do. And that's it. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Um, uh, Ms. Karpernak. I guess I'll be the fifth uh, board member to speak. I guess um, there's only five of us today. Um, I am concerned with the safety issue of the, the light, the LED signs in general, to be honest. Um, I nearly um, ran a red light the other night because a sign flashed green and it flashed where the red light was and I nearly took my foot off um, the brake. <laughs> so I think I'm going to err on the side of uh, public safety and vote um, against the sign on both, uh, both roads. Okay, uh, Ms. Carpenter, since you're the last to speak, would you would you want to throw a motion in, Mr. Chairman? Oh, okay. Um, I okay, sure. I will move to uh, vote against the request um, due to the concern with public safety. Can I second that? Okay, so there is a motion to deny the application for the variance. Um, any more discussion? Okay, we will do, we will do a roll call vote, uh, and I'll take it in alphabetical order. I think it's alphabetical. Ms. Davis? I vote against the motion. Okay. Ms. Karpenak? Uh, in favor. Mr. Lawless? In favor. Mr. Newton? Against. And I'm in favor. So it fails to receive four votes.
And, um, okay. <laughs> that application does not pass. Still on the agenda for next time. Vice Chair, this is Lisa Minton. Um, since the appeal failed to receive the four affirmative votes, the case will remain on the board's agenda for the next 30 days uh, so that other board members uh, may, may vote on this case. Correct. Okay, thank you for correcting me on that. So we had three we had three votes in favor of the motion by my so we did not have four. So it remains on the agenda for thirty days, correct? That is correct. The next appeal date is January seventh of twenty twenty one. <clears throat> okay are we ready for the next case we are we will go ahead next case for the board to consider is yep. case 2020 this, this, this case was previously heard at the december 3rd meeting they were requesting a variance to the street setbacks along lishy avenue and also special exception from landscape buffer requirements along lishy avenue and the alley. This is the case that Council Member Parker spoke uh, about in his call earlier today during the meeting. And I will, after I go through the slides, I will uh, summarize the conditions and then let the appellant speak at that point. The property is within the CS zoning district. It's a corner property here with Lishy and Trinity, East Trinity Lane, the aerial view. Lower right corner is the subject property. Other slide is the, I believe, property across the street. Looking along the streets in both directions. This is the updated slide that was uh, provided by the appellant showing the um, actual setback. The corner unit, unit one, the condition is that 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 unit will be at a 10 foot setback along Lishy Avenue. That was one of the conditions that was agreed to. The remaining five units will be at a five foot setback along Lishy Avenue. Another condition was that the landscaping would be uh, exempt along both the alley and Lishy Avenue. That condition was agreed upon but that they would build to the street tree requirements within the grass strip between Lishy Avenue and the sidewalk. The other condition was that there would be no short-term rentals for this property. This was the original slide presented. So at this point, the applicant can now address the board. Please state your name and address and then present your case. Hey, Lisa, this is Shanti Davis. I just wanted to note my recusal before the applicant started. Noted. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, Mr. Vice Chairman, this is Dwayne Cuthbertson. Uh, I'm at 409 Merritt Avenue. I'm representing the owner of this property. Uh, as Ms. Minton described, we are looking at requesting the variance of the street setback just on Lishy and then the special exceptions for the um, landscape buffers. Uh, these requests are intended to accommodate a residential development. Uh, six residential townhomes are proposed on this CS zone property. And the real intent behind our request is so that we can flip the orientation. Uh, as you saw in the previous slide, uh, we adhere to the strict requirements of the zoning code. We would be effectively forced to put our parking and driving area in front of these buildings in between us and Lishy Avenue. And we are trying to provide a more urban orientation. So we're asking for a variance to bring the buildings forward and give us space uh, to put the parking in the rear. Um, and so we had a pretty lively discussion at the last hearing and there were a few concerns here at that hearing. And I feel like we've had uh, some healthy communication between that hearing and today. And, Yep, my client has agreed to uh, restrict short-term rentals uh, 
with this residential development. Uh, he's also uh, pushed that northern building back uh, five more feet so that he improves the, the site distance or uh, addresses that site distance concern. And then the, the third condition is, yeah, he, he um, agrees to, to do the do the landscape planting that the buffers would require elsewhere on the site, including in that um, that tree planting strip. So I feel like with those conditions, we, we really satisfied a lot of the concerns that were brought up at the last hearing. And um, with these requests, the, we talked to the urban forester and he's supportive of our request. We've got the support of the neighbors immediately to the east and to the south. Um, planning department staff has looked at our requests and they've also recommended uh, support. And now, and I heard at the beginning of the meeting that our council member, uh, council member Parker uh, has weighed in and, and he's now supportive of our request. So with that, I'll, I'll stop talking and answer any questions you might have, but uh, ask that you support the request as well. Uh, Mr. Cutburson, this is this is Mr. Pepper. So when you say you've agreed to restrict short-term rental, do you mean by that there will none of these units will be allowed to be uh, short-term rented? That's correct. None of these units, uh, not my client or not future owners, uh, none of them could apply for a short-term rental permit. Okay, so it will essentially that will be a restriction that will run with with the with these units. If, if you grant the variances and we execute that variance by getting a building permit on it, then yes, that condition runs with the land. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, any do, do any other board members have questions? And again, Mr. Lawless, I can't see your hand. So yeah, I, I, I just wanted clarification and I think you got it, uh, Mr. Chairman, that there will never be any short-term rentals on in this particular development i just want to just clarify that because i guess the lawyer in me perked up and i wanted to make sure there wasn't any wiggle room there yeah i don't understand there to be but i'll let mr uh Cuthbert yeah. should answer that question again yeah just for the record okay um it might be more appropriate to ask the um the board's attorney but i think if, if you all are clear in your condition that short-term rentals are restricted uh, with this townhouse development as proposed from here until eternity um, then i think it it carries forward with this property after the development and future owners could not then apply for short-term rentals okay thank you uh and Mr. Cuthbertson, I, I remember from the last hearing that, I mean, I think you've essentially conceded there is no hardship here. Um, it's just that the zoning you don't think is um, what it ought to be for this property and, and not like similarly situated properties. Is that, or, or is there some type of hardship? Well, Mr. Pepper, I, I do think that there is a unique circumstance and a, and a hardship the property is zoned CS, and it's uh, we, we can debate this, but I believe that CS is a more suburban zoning uh, standard that's more applicable to these larger commercial uh, lots that you find out in Antioch, Rivergate, um, Bellevue, and and they're not necessarily uh, suited uh, for urban corridors such as Trinity Lane. And our lot is a very it's a particularly narrow lot given. Um, its relationship to that zoning. And so to use it in a manner that is consistent with this urban corridor, if you will, um, and, and it, adhere to the strict you know, requirements of that CS zoning, it, it leaves you very little, very few options uh, to use it, again, in a way that's consistent with the corridor. So I, I think its narrowness um, is a unique circumstance, again, given the zoning, given the context on the urban corridor, and it forces us into a pattern that, in our opinion, is out of character um, with the intent of you know, where this corridor is going. So the the, your, the the hardship you're asserting is not the, the zoning, the hardship is the narrowness of the lot. Uh, yes, sir. Um, if this lot how do you, what, how is it, I mean, how do we, in comparison to what, adjoining lots? 
Um, I think in comparison to um, the typical CS lot found in Davidson County, uh, most of our urban corridors are zoned mixed use. This one isn't yet. It hasn't been rezoned to mixed use. And we can argue well, that that might be the more appropriate remedy, but you know, we're looking at this on a, on a case by case scenario. And, um, you know, so I, I have to work with what I have and we have a CS lot that makes us push these buildings way back. And um, to us, you know, that's out of character with the corridor. So uh, if this lot wasn't as narrow as it is, uh, we, we wouldn't have that problem necessarily. Our Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Lawless. If I can, our, so our, is it your comments that we're being, basically you're asking us to, to legislate as an, as a board versus taking it to the, to the appropriate legislative body, correct? Is that, well, is that where we're at? No, sir. Uh, we're asking for one element of relief. Uh, on this. Otherwise, we can satisfy every other requirement of, of the CS zoning. The special exception is is a second element of relief, but it's it's a different pathway. It's, it's a right, but you exception. could have you 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 could have made the request to the council member, and I did hear the council member earlier. And I'm just I, it's philosophically, I'm just trying to work through it, Wayne. Okay, that's and, right. Yeah, you're 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 absolutely right. We we okay. could have gone down that path. In our minds, again, we only needed this one element of relief. And, and to us, this is in part the role of the BZA is to grant these very specific um, elements of relief to allow uh, outcomes that are appropriate. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Any other board members have questions for Mr. Cutperson? I, I do not see any hands, so um we will take uh calls uh if someone would let us know if there are any calls in the queue yes we have one call in the queue okay and mr chair we're still on two minutes right for calls coming correct. in. correct all, all calls are two minutes for or against so Oh, you're ready. Yeah. Um, hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Gordon Stacy Harmon, and as I appeared at the last, um, uh, uh, sir, can you can you give us your residential address, please? Before yes. You call? yes, sir. I do reside at one eight two six Joy Circle, approximately um, half a mile from less than half a mile from this location. Um, okay. I do take I do take a little bit of umbrance with. Um, that's Mr. Cuthbertson's uh, comment that the neighborhood is in agreement. We don't necessarily agree with uh, this particular development of this parcel in this way, um, simply because we can't stop it. I, I do say that there is a there there isn't really been any proof of hardship in a situation that they can build six units on the property currently. But I wish it would have gone through the rezoning process because then we would have had greater input on the actual. Imp um, impact on the neighborhood. Residential zoning would have required 20-foot setbacks off of East Trinity as well as 20-foot setbacks off of Lishy. Um, we can avoid that by doing an SP on this particular property, which is in this particular situation a little more appropriate, I believe, than trying to get a change to the law based on a hardship case that hasn't been proven. That's my comment at this point. I yield the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, do we have any other callers in the queue? We do not. Okay, uh, I think Mr. Cutburson probably has some time left. Um, he does. He has okay. two minutes and 32 seconds. Okay, would you like to use that time, Mr. Cutburson? Sure, yes, sir. All right. Um, so, quick responses. I, I, I hope that I didn't imply that we have neighborhood support. Um, we have support from the two abutting neighbors uh, that would be impacted most by the, um, the landscape offer. We have letters from those two. I've spoken to a few, a small hand, a handful of neighbors uh, since our notices went out and we had our required community meeting. 
and, and they were all fine, but you know, I, I hope I didn't imply that we have neighborhood support necessarily. Um, you know, two, the, the rezoning, if, if you look at the land use policy for this corridor and we were to rezone it, and I, I don't want to spend too much time on the rezone issue, but if we were to rezone it, it's very, very likely we'd get an A district similar to the one across the street, uh, across Lishy from us. They have an RM15A zoning district. That A zoning district it requires a build two line. So when that lot redevelops, those houses have to be built up to that zero to 15 feet um, within the uh, zero to 15 feet from the, the property line. So what we're asking for is is consistent with the land use policy and, and the zoning that that land use policy supports it's consistent with the zoning across the street. Um, the six units is allowed by by the existing zoning. Uh, the building height that we're proposing is allowed by the existing zoning. The only element of relief we're asking for is a variance of that street setback on Lishy. That's it. We're, we intend to meet the street setback on Trinity. Um, and, and we're, we're, we're asking for this one very specific element of relief from the zoning code so that we can flip our orientation and bring the houses closer to Lishi, orient them toward Lishi, uh, to create a, just a better um, streetscape, a better experience along the Lishi Avenue sidewalk and put our parking in the rear. Um, that's something that's been expressed as desirable all over Davidson County, uh, particularly in the core. And again, we can debate whether Trinity is in the core or not, but it, it's an older street. It has urban orientation up and down um, this corridor. If you go further east, most of the new development is coming up closer to the streets, and certainly its parking is put behind the building. Um, so that's really what we're trying to accomplish with, again, this very specific element of relief. We're not looking to rezone the property through the BZA. We intend to comply with uh, every other uh, standard. The only variance we're asking for is from the setback on Lishi. Uh, we have talked to, uh, again, planning department supports it. The council member has indicated he supports it. Um, we're going to improve the sidewalk back there uh, along Lishy. Our five foot setback is from the new sidewalk, uh, that eight foot sidewalk. Uh, so we feel like, again, what we're asking for creates an environment that most people seem to support. It's a very narrow element of relief that we're asking from this board. Um, and we feel like, again, the narrowness of this lot is is our, the basis of our, our, our hardship on the serving corridor. So I'll just rest with that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Cutburson. Uh, do we have any other calls perhaps in the queue? We don't, and I'll just clarify that the appellant actually has four minutes remaining because he had a total of 10 minutes because someone did call in for opposition should he want to use that remaining four minutes. Okay, I think he had concluded, but I won't speak for him, Mr. Cutburst. Do you have anything else? I don't think I. Okay. I don't think I, I don't think I can talk anymore. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, yes, okay, sir. we will uh, open it up for. We'll close the public hearing and open it up for discussion. So um, I don't see any hands up. I will go ahead and start, and I, you know. I understand the applicant that going through the rezoning process is more expensive and more time consuming, and I get that, but I'm not on the planning commission. I'm on the board of zoning appeals. It, it was very clear to me at the, the last time we heard this case that everybody pretty much conceded there was not a hardship other than that, that the applicant felt like this property was not zoned appropriately, and that's, that's just not a hardship. And, um, you know, I, I have a real problem that with, uh, you, I think, I, I would feel like, like I said, I'm not on the planning commission, and I would feel like that if there's no hardship, it would be transparent for me that, that I would be approving this variance because there was no hardship, but, but the zoning, the applicant didn't feel like was appropriate. And I really think that's not a good thing. Um, that's not the way we ought to conduct government. I, I will say, I think the I think the plan is 
is a good plan. I think the applicant has, has, has done a very good job of working with the neighbors. And I don't think I would personally, if I were a neighbor, have any problem with this. But my problem is I think that the, the process is onerous as it can be sometimes on, on applicants um, has to be followed. And if it's, if it's not working correctly, then the way to deal with that is not taking a shortcut to the board of the zoning appeals. So um, that's, that's my thoughts on it. So was that a motion? I hope. Well, it can be. It looks like Miss Mr. Newton's got his hand yeah, I'll, 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 Yeah. Okay. 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 Appreciate it. Um, well, I, I would agree. Well, I'll agree with you, Mr. Pepper. I also would hate to see these built as garage facing residences. <laughs> and, and, and as from an urbanism, from an urban design perspective, I would I would hate to see uh, that we just go ahead and build it as garage facing the street. Um, just, it's just not, not, not what our, our national, you know, national next are, are, you know, all the other plans we have, uh, don't favor that kind of thing. So I, I would agree that this is not the right process for it, but I would also <laughs> be of the mind that I, I don't want them to, uh, in order to bypass the, the process they should go through, uh to uh be, just build something that that shouldn't be there for a different reason okay thank you mr newton miss carpenter has got her hand up sure i'll um agree with both of you that I, the process um would be better to go through a different process but i agree with mr newton and um you know there's the potential they're going to build um exactly as he noted. And the planning department didn't weigh in on this particular item, but when you read their um, their memo regarding the uh, landscape buffer, um, it does mention the policy, uh, T4 urban mixed use corridor, intended to enhance urban mixed use, use corridors by encouraging a greater mix of higher density, which is what is shown here. Uh, and it talks about creating buildings that are compatible with general general character of urban neighborhoods, which is what the applicant's trying to do. Um, so my guess is that they would probably be in favor of what is shown um, with the, the residents moving closer to the street than moving uh, back closer to the neighboring property line. So I know that's conjecture, but I have a feeling this this property would end up exactly where it is <laughs> as we see it on the screen. Okay, thank you, Ms. Karpinek. Well, I mean, we did have one neighbor that called in and said that, you know, he would have preferred this to go through the zoning process. And, but I will say, Ms. Karpinek and Mr. Newton, you make, you make great points. And I mean, I think that it it's, remains to be seen whether if we don't approve this application, something that's less desirable for the neighbors will be built. I just, it, it for me, respecting the process um, in a kind of a more um, long-term way is, I just can't, and I, I just can't see the hardship. So, uh, but I think you both make really good points. And it's a hard case because I do think that this is a really good development, and uh, and we have an applicant that's been over backwards to try to make it work. But I still can't see a hardship. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I I agree with your comments, but I'm as with you. I think one that likes to respect the lane of traffic that I'm driving in. And I think this was probably more appropriate going through planning, changing it that way instead of coming in and circum basically in my mind circumventing. Uh, I think Dwayne did a great job. I think, and I do think we've got someone that's going to do what whatever they can. And I'm not so terribly sure if they went to planning. I'm like you. Mr. Chairman, I think that that would get approved, or if it did, not be shocked. 
but I'm not on planet. Don't want to be on planet. Kind of like where I, right where I am. And I think that, you know, I, I think I don't want to expand our, what we do. Um, and I appreciated the, the concession not to have short term rentals and for maybe the forethought of helping the people that are getting those cases going forward that we're giving them. Um, but I think it's, it really should have gone to planning or it should have gone the normal process instead of coming to us and, and creating or finding or searching out a hardship. that's just, I don't think is there. So. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lawless. Ms. Karpinek, you have your hand up. Uh -huh. Yeah, I wanted to clarify that I um, I do see a hardship in the lot is very narrow for a CS zone lot. Okay. Any uh, further discussion? Any motion? Mr. Newton? Yes, I'll, I'll make a motion that uh, the variance is approved due to the, the exceptional narrowness of the lot uh, with the condition that there, uh, that short-term rentals are disallowed and that that uh, first unit is, uh, is moved back to 10 feet as shown in the, uh, in the exhibit on the screen right now. Okay, and, and to clarify, when you say that short-term rentals will not be allowed, do you mean um, forever, essentially, that that will run for Okay. Yes, that's correct. Okay. All right, there's a motion on the floor. Do we have a second to that motion? Ms. Carpenter? I'll second, but I wanted to add that I think we have to still rule on the special exception for the landscape buffer. Is that correct? Um. I I thought we just had a, a variance request before us. This is Lisa Minton. There is a variance request for the setback of the building and also special exception for exemption from the landscape buffer. Um, there was also a condition that the remaining units of this building would have a five foot setback along Lishy Avenue instead of the required 15. So there were four conditions. No STRP uh, rentals, uh, 10 foot setback for unit one, five foot setback for the remaining five units, and the special exception um, exemption for landscaping along Lishy Avenue and the unimproved alley. Hey, uh, Mr. Newton, would you like to amend your motion to include those conditions and to include approval of the special exception? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, so amended, do we have a second for that amendment? Oh. I'll second that. Okay, and it's been seconded by Ms. Parpenek. Okay, we will take a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Davis, for or against? Oh, that's right, Ms. Davis is out on this one, I'm sorry. Uh, Ms. Carpenek, for or against? Uh, in favor. Mr. Lawless, for or against? I'm against the motion, I mean the uh, proposal. Okay, Mr. Newton? In favor. Okay, and I am against, so it fails to obtain four votes. And uh, for the applicant, it will remain on the agenda for 30 more days. Is that correct, Ms. Minton? Yes, that is correct. Okay, I got it right the second time, so. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, thank you. Um, before we move to the next case, I would like to uh, make a motion that we take about a 10-minute break. Second. <laughs> Okay. Anybody opposed to that? <laughs> okay. So we'll take a 10 minute break. Ms. Karpinek. I'm present. Mr. Lawless. I'm physically present. <laughs> Mr. Newton. <laughs> I'm present. <laughs> and I'm I'm here physically and mentally, I hope. So you're driving the boat, so I hope so too. All right, with that we'll turn it over to Lisa. 
All right, welcome back. The next case for the board to consider will be case 2020-231. This includes multiple properties along Brick Church Pike. In the initial request, it included five different parcels. They have amended their request um, to only uh, ask for a variance from the floor area ratio for zero Brick Church Pike. I'll go through the slides. This is the, the overview of the parcel view map and the highlighted red parcel is the only one they're requesting the variance on. The original variance was for all five parcels, um, but they were able to uh, develop the other parcels under the current zoning and will not be combining those parcels. There's the aerial view. There's the subject property. The street views in both directions and to the right is the property across the street. <clears throat> Here's an overview of the proposed development of each of the parcels in the parcel uh, on the far right of your screen, a zero brick church pike. They're proposing four units on that property. Um, and the variance request is from the 6,326 square foot allowable floor area uh, within the MUNA zoning district. They're requesting a variance to allow for 8,000 square feet. Um, at, at this point, the applicant can address the board and please state your name and address uh, and go ahead and present your case at this point. I'm getting an Alvin and the Chipmunks is sort of what I'm hearing. I'm hearing the same thing. So applicant, I don't know what's going on with your phone. Uh, but we're not able to hear you. It's uh, applicant. Are you there? He's actually muted right now. This is Chardé from Metro ITS. Uh, Mr. Scruggs, I need you to go to the top of your WebEx screen and hit audio and video and switch audio. I need you to view the call-in information and call in using your cell phone because of the technical difficulties with your computer. I don't want the bread. I think Mr. Scruggs is having a difficult time with technology. Mr. Scruggs, we're still not able to hear you. Saturday morning cartoons. Either that or he's doing deep underwater diving. <laughs> Mr. Scruggs, we can't hear you. And, and uh, what was asked is that you would hang up and call back in on your cell phone. Okay, so what I'm going to suggest. Okay, Mr. Scruggs, if you can, if you can just stop, stop talking for we, we can't. It's just noise. We can't understand anything you're saying, and perhaps I'll, I'll rely on the wisdom of the technology people here. But perhaps we need to go to the next case and come back to 231. So. We'll go to case 2020-234. Case 2020-234 is located at 139 C&D Elmhurst Avenue. And they're requesting variances from side setbacks and landscape buffer requirements to construct two uh, single family dwellings on two separate parcels. Um, this proposed development will require subdivision of the existing parcel and also an amendment to the plat notes through planning prior to any site plan review by the zoning staff. Here's an overview of the parcel. Aerial view. It's a subject property. It's 
street views in both directions and the property across the street. Here's the proposed site plan that the appellant has provided. The applicant will now address the board. Please state your name and address and present your case. Can everyone hear me? Yes, if you'd state your name and, and your address, please. Sure. Just want to make sure after that uh, last case, everyone could hear me. Um, this is Chip Howarth with uh, Alfred Benson Company, 401 Church Street, Suite 1600, Nashville, Tennessee, 37219, representing the applicant in this case. Um, so what we have uh, here, our, the hardship uh, presented with us in this case is the narrowness of our lots. Um, we have two lots, 139C and 139D Elmhurst, um, both that were zoned, rezoned RM20 NS earlier this year, each of which is 25 feet wide. We're proposing, as you can see from the site plan, we're proposing to build two units on uh, 139C and two units on 139D. My uh, client, who I believe is also has the ability to answer questions, um, is a big proponent and a longtime developer of affordable housing, workforce housing, and uh, is proposing to do that on this property. And to do such, I um, wanted to increase the density sought with the RM20 rezoning um, to pursue that type of development. Um, the issues that we are uh, presented with on the, due to the nearness of our lot is that under RM20, our side setbacks for each of those lots will be five feet on each side which would render our buildable envelope essentially 15 feet wide on both 139C and 139D. Additionally, the properties to both the north of 139D and the south of 139C are, are currently zoned RS5. So by code, we would have to do a landscape buffer, um, which would be 10 feet. Uh, because the proposed landscape buffer under the code would take uh, up up to more than 20% of our lot area, we are allowed per code to um, reduce that to five feet uh, as long as we accompany that five foot landscape buffer with a six foot masonry, six foot tall masonry wall. Um, uh, still to a point where our buildable envelope is now still 15 feet wide. So our the relief sought by our variance request uh, due to the hardship presented by the narrowness of our lot is uh, seeking to reduce both the setback and side setbacks on each lot, as well as the proposed northern landscape buffer on 139D and the southern landscape buffer on 139C, reduce both of those requirements from five feet to three feet. Um, and then we would propose to retain the six foot tall masonry wall. If that's something that you guys are interested in, that would be fine for us to do. Um, but that's the relief that we're seeking is a, again, side setback reductions from five feet to three feet, and then a landscape buffer reduction on both the northern boundary of 139D and the southern boundary of 139C from five feet to three feet, um, which will allow us to pursue uh, the uh, type of workforce development that my client um, pursues on a regular basis on this property and allows us to do two units on each property. And I think I will retain the rest of my time yeah. Um, yeah. as needed. You have a minute. Okay, and Mr. Seconds left. Okay, uh, and Mr. Howarth, this is Mr. Pepper. It doesn't look like there are, there are any objections in our package. Have, have you had any opposition from neighbors? No, and I know Councilman Parker spoke at the beginning. Um, we've talked with him, and he's been supportive. Of, I've not heard anything from any neighbors. I, again, I didn't get to see the board packet, so I, I didn't know what was in there. It's quite good to hear there's no objections. But I know I've not heard from anyone objecting to this. Okay, thank you. Vice Chair, oh. I, just, I just want to clarify that per the plat restrictions, um, this is not two separate parcels at this point. Um, I believe Joey Hart... Hello? Yes, can you hear me speaking? Yes, I lost you for a second there. Okay, um, just wanted to clarify that the purpose of the plat and the plat note restrictions was for the original lot to have two separate parties to accommodate and attach a dwelling, and both portions combined are to be considered one zone lot as defined by the Metropolitan Zoning Ordinance. Each zone lot shall continue to be deemed a single zone lot within the meaning of that term under section seven, I'm sorry, 
1210 of the ordinance. Um, so just to clarify, they're proposing that this is a, a two parcel development and that subdivision has not taken place yet. And this plat, uh, these plat notes also do restrict the type of development they're proposing. So they're they're asking for um, variances from the zoning code uh, prior to any plat note amendments or lot subdivisions. I just want to make sure that you, you understand that that the sequence you're voting on. Okay, and so the, then the frontage on the current lot would be 50 feet. Is that correct? It's as as it exists today, it is a 50 foot lot. Yes. 50-foot okay. road range by 150. It's can we a see the parcel at this point? Please, What's can we see the uh, aerial view again? Please. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. okay. Do we? Um, we have any callers in the queue? I would expect not, but we do not. Okay. Um, so uh, the applicant has how much time left? A minute and fifty seconds. Okay. Mr. Chairman, may I ask the applicant a quick question? Absolutely. How, what are you planning or proposing to put in if you're fortunate enough to get through this? And exercise today in the landscape buffer on the sides. Sure, in terms of what types of units? No, what type of what type of buffer? I'm and, and you may not have heard some of the previous meetings that we have had. I'm a I'm a big tree and and landscape type of proponent for for tight situations or for any any type of granting of stuff like this so i like green around people it's just healthier sure so uh we again we're a bit limited with this is kind of up for um discussion i guess because uh per the code you know i mentioned that we had to do that six foot tall masonry wall or we could do a six foot tall masonry wall and reduce our buffer by right because of the size of the landscape buffer. So it would be an exercise that we'd wanna go through with our landscape architect to figure out one, what could we put in there? Because again, my, and my client, he can speak to this. We'd want um, the, some of those amenities as well, but if we do have to do that wall there and then have units that close to it, I wanna make sure that whatever we put in there um, lives. And I'm just, I'm, I'm not a landscape architect, so I, I couldn't speak to that exactly, but I, I would share that concern for sure. I mean, I have no clue either. I'm, you know, it depends on what the plan is, whether I've got a green thumb or a, and I can grow the heck out of weeds, but I have a hard time with things that flower. Um, so I, have you had any contact or would you coordinate with the city arborist or anything like that sure we would absolutely have to when we we went through the process we'd have to work with the urban forester um and to meet the requirements and then they have listed in the code of course y'all know this i don't know why i'm saying this but um stuff that would be required the types of planting that goes in those buffers that we would have to comply with um and we would certainly comply with those at a minimum thank you sir uh, so, Mr. Howarth, this is uh, uh, Ross Pepper. The, I mean, I think the hardship you're relying on is the narrowness of the lots, which I believe you said was 25 feet. But am I incorrect that as we sit here today, this is still one lot with 50 foot of frontage? And if so, how does that, how does that change your uh, position on the hardship? Well, I think, so again, this is by, by the 1986 plat, this is one lot, but it has been um, um, rezoned as, as if it was two. And so the rezoning that went through this year, and I, I was listening earlier, so I'm very cognizant. I was very glad to be able to say that we've gone through and entitled this thing before we came to you guys. Um, you know, we've rezoned it to RM20 with the idea that um, to pursue more density on this. And of course we worked with both planning and, and the council member to do that. And so um, I, I'm not sure that I'm exactly answering your question, but in terms of like when we pursue this development anyway, the replat from 1986 will have to be re-examined. And we were planning to do that anyway. And we've been working with um, 
staff on that just because of the sequencing of events lends itself, in our opinion, to coming to the BZA first to ask for their relief because whether or not we get the relief requested here will determine whether or not we pursue a plat. Um, and so our intent, of course, is to um, meet the density that was envisioned when we rezoned the property to RM20. And, and uh, so to do that, we will force that to replat and address those issues that you're talking about in the 1986 okay. plat. So I think I understand what you're saying is it's been rezoned so that you can subdivide the lot and create two lots. Is that correct? That just hasn't been done yet, right? Correct. Because okay. again, it's it's what chicken, a little bit of chicken and eggs. Um, you know, right. us going through the plat process, like it doesn't make sense for us to do that now if we don't know if sure. we can get the relief that we need. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. I, I get that. So thank you. Uh, any other board members have questions? Okay, and I'm assuming we still don't have any callers in the queue on this case. We do not. Okay, so we'll close the public hearing and uh, discuss. Hey, Mr. Chairman, just uh, one quick question. This is Joey Hargis, just intervening a little bit. Um, the, the the reason we, the plat that's here is one of those old zero lot line duplexes uh, that was recorded in the mid eighties. And it, it has some language on the plat that says that we're to treat, that these are not separate lots. It's essentially a zone lot for purposes of zoning and uh, it actually restricts the use of the property to a single structure that spans both um, both properties in the zone lot. So um, part of the, the issue that's, you know, while we didn't send them to that before, if, if by chance the board denied their request here, um, it doesn't invalidate the, the prior plat that, that, that had been recorded so to not undo it. But I think I caution you guys a little bit too that, uh, any action this board takes is subject to the planning commission uh, amending the plat and removing those those uh, said restrictions that are on there. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And I think I think what you're saying is it 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 does make sense not to go to the planning commission first. It does in the sense that that word the board inclined to deny this request. They right. You know, his, his action is undoes the plat too and kind of kind of messes them up there as well. So. Gotcha. Okay. Well, thanks for telling us that. Okay. Uh, board members, any, uh, Ms. Davis. Uh, and, and Mr. Chairman, Ms. Davis, I'm sorry. Let me just one, one other thing. Um, we'll have to look at his site plan. I know he submitted it here in front of you. We've got to look at it once the plat does occur because to make sure there's not any zoning issues that he's violating under uh, RM20. Um, Thank you. Uh, Ms. Davis? I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Did you close the public hearing? Is the applicant done? I didn't want to talk if we're not ready. To yeah, we, we closed the public hearing. Okay. Um, uh, I'm probably the only one that sees it this way and that's fine and I said this before and I'll say it again I think certain horses aren't designed for certain courses every horse ain't meant to ride every course and to me these are very narrow lots they're 0.18th of an acre and I understand that they went through rezoning and that they entitled it but it seems like to me by rezoning it this was sort of a self-imposed hardship like yes they've rezoned it and got the entitlement but now they're asking for a variance because the lots aren't necessarily narrow. They're narrow because of what they're trying to put on it. So I, for me, it's hard for me to make the logical leap and say that there's something inherently wrong with this lot that would justify a variance. It seems to me that the plan for the particular lot is what's creating the variance. And I don't think that that's how, what we're supposed to look at. So that's one of my issues with it and then another thing i know that everyone agrees that workhouse um housing is important but that's sort of irrelevant to our review of this plat and review of the variance um i don't live necessarily i don't live too far from this street and i'm on 0.18th of an acre and i can tell you that it's a very narrow lot um i can probably reach out my window and touch my neighbor's house if i really wanted to so um those are just my initial thoughts 
Thank you, Ms. Davis. Uh, anybody else? So, so if I understand what Shanti's saying to us is basically it's a self-imposed hardship that we're being asked to rescue from. Am I right, Ms. Davis? Yes, Mr. Wallace, you are <laughs> correct. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> okay, I'm glad to see an architect uh, raise their hand, Mr. Newton. I don't, I don't know how, how much that weighs in here, but I mean, frankly, but it, it, this obviously it has the support of the councilman. It has obviously support, or it will require the support of the planning commission to make this happen. Um, so, I mean, if, if this was denied because of lack of hardship, would that just be on a technicality of what everyone wants to happen here? I mean, I. I, I, I do I do see that there is some there's some argument for lack of hardship, but if you know if everyone wants it to happen, then why should we keep it from happening? And I'm not a lawyer, so you, you know, lawyers can speak to that. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Dent. Ms. Carpenter. Well, I'm not an attorney either, and I agree with Ms. Davis and also Mr. Newton. How can I agree with both of you since you both said opposite things? But um, it does seem like it's a lot to fit on these two lots, and I don't recall that the actual phrase with the horse. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I... I I think it's great that they rezoned it and have the support of the council person too. So that also weighs in and I, I haven't decided how, um, how I'll vote yet. I, hopefully um, others will weigh in too. Thank you, Ms. Carpenter. Um, I'm, I'm kind of where uh, Ms. Carpenter is. I'm, I see both sides of this and Although it's it's kind of hard for me to um, get by the self-imposed. If if somebody can tell me um, how this isn't self-imposed, I guess that would be influential for me. It's I mean, I, the the property owner has the right to create two you know tw two lots with twenty five foot of feet of frontage, which those would be I think exceptionally narrow lots. And, but the, the property owner doesn't necessarily have to do that. So, and I'll, I, I, maybe a situation like this has come up before the board before. And with my uh, lack of short term and long term memory, I have forgotten it. But I'm, um, I just, I've never had to wrestle with it, um, a situation like this. And I do think 25 feet is an exceptionally, is a narrow, lot and and that would in and of itself deserve a um you know consideration as a hardship but i'm and i you know i'm i don't know i hope uh well mr lawless has, has got his hand up so we'll well let him weigh in us thank you i uh, first off i take a point of personal privilege. I love that my two architect friends apologize that they're not lawyers. I sometimes wish I wasn't either. So that being the case, I have a hard time overcoming Ms. Davis's discussion of a self-imposed. I kind of wish they were coming to us at the end of the process. And I understand Joey's comment about, you know, they'd lose the plat. Um, and it's sort of, I don't like being sandwiched in the middle. I don't like, I, I it's self-imposed. Someone's gonna have to convince me that it's not self-imposed. I wish, I mean, it's a project I would, I think it's a great idea. Um, it's a whole lot bigger than the apartments that I lived in when I was in college. I wouldn't imagine what I could do with something that nice, but they did it to themselves. So I'm like you, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm needing to be convinced, but right now I'm pretty well swayed by Ms. Davis's 
horse analogy. Thank you, Mr. Lawless. So um, and I know uh, Mr. Hargis knows a lot more about the law on this than I do. I mean, I, I do get that if you buy a piece of property and it has, for example, a big a sewage easement on it, that's not a self-imposed hardship because that, that characteristic of the property was there when you bought it. But if you create the hardship, that's that's the type of, um, that's, that's, that's when it's self-imposed. And it, it seems to me like this is a situation in which um, that, that this hardship is being created by the property owner. But um, if I'm missing something on that, Mr. Hargis, if you could weigh in on that, because I, I know that um, you have um, in a former life been before the sport on issues like this and, and were very knowledgeable about the self-imposed hardship the law in that regard. So, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but if, if I'm off base on kind of my interpretation, if you can weigh in and, and tell us. You were putting them on the spot. Go ahead and admit it, Ross. <laughs> well, <laughs> well I, I don't, I don't think you're mischaracterizing that Mr. Pepper. I, you know, it's it, as I have argued for this board before it's the, it's the actions of the, of the, the applicant or someone with a monetary interest in, in front of it. And the, the case you talked about was one that the was a case where the government placed this gigantic easement on a piece of property. Um, so it wasn't the owner, the actions of the owner. Um, of course, I'm respectful to the applicant. I've talked to him too about the, the platting situation. We at first came down of, no, the board can't hear this. You need to go get this plat fixed. But uh, to, to his benefit too, if, if he's not successful here, he undoes a plat which you can't fix. There's no there's no undoing the the amendment of that plat. So it's a final it's a final outcome if he does the plat first, um, regardless of how this board does. So I did not want to prejudice his, his existing situation uh, in front of this. You know, with his entitlement, he's in, he's entitled to under today's zoning. You know, yeah, on the other hand, too, of course, my, my statements earlier were he's requested what he's requested before you, and it's fine that the board, uh, if you feel there's proper hardship under law to grant the variance, just understand it is subject to this plat uh, recording. And, and other thing, too, the site plan he's showing you, we'd have to review it against the, the zoning code uh, as submitted because he, he's requested landscape buffer variances and and uh, side setback, but they're, you know, uh, if there are other items that arise in that, he'd either have to fill those too. So, what, Joey, may I ask a quick question, Mr. Chairman? Sure. sure. Uh, it, it, it is, he can still build or do something on the property. He just can't build what he intends or what he wants to. Is that correct? I mean, he could build a single dwelling on it right now if he wanted to. Sure. Uh, Lisa, I don't know if you've got access to the plat. I mean, if you can pass the, the, I guess the ball to me, I can share the plat to the members to show them. I wasn't meaning to step on anybody's whatever we're supposed to be doing. I was just trying to, I mean, it's self-imposed and that's what we're trying to figure out. And, and if it's, if you can still do something with it, I guess is where I'm headed with my very inartful questions. Well, to, to your question, um, I think Lisa's pulling up the plat now. All that he can build is what is recorded on the plat because this particular plat not only laid out um, specific conditions about what can be built, it had a actual physical location of where they had to be built. And we don't see that on plats. There we go. Here's, here's, a, here's the actual plat for the there property. Cool. Okay. So he can still build something. It's not like he's. Well, to the point is all he can build is what you see here. Yes, yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. Now, also, uh, one other option, if he just amends the plat through planning, if they allow that, his zoning would allow him to build his four units on that 50 foot by one, uh, 150, um, if he has a lot area, because it's an it's a 20, den 20 units per acre density, he would still be able to do four units but he would have to amend the plat to remove all these restrictions 
that you see on the screen right now, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Huh? Thank okay. you. Thank you. Kevin. So thanks, Joey. Yeah, because at the time this plat was recorded, I think it was zoned single family. So that's um, or or you know R or RS at the time. But. Okay. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Argus. Um, okay. So uh, does anybody have any more? Uh, thoughts or a motion. I, I will say that I was on the fence, but I'm, I'm, and I don't think there's anything wrong with this development, but I, I think that it is, it is a lot on a lot. And I do see that this is, you know, I just don't know how I get around that it's not self-imposed. So, um, I think Ashanti should make the motion. I'm happy to make the motion. <laughs> I, I move that this variance, excuse me, I'm sorry. I move that this variance request be denied due to a lack of hardship. I'll second the motion. Okay, we have a motion that the application uh, for a variance be denied. And we have a second. Let's, I'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Davis, how do you vote? In favor. In favor. Okay, Ms. Karpinak. In favor. Mr. Lawless. In favor. Mr. Newton. Against. And I'm in favor. So that uh, motion passes with four votes by my calculation. So uh, thank you, applicant, uh, for your presentation, and we'll move to the next case. Jessica, is the applicant available for case 2020-231? We believe he is. We're looking for him right now. He's on. He was on, and give us just a second. Is that Mr. Scruggs again? Yes. <laughs> this is 2020-231. Okay, thank you. Hello? We're going to give something a try here real quick. Uh, is Robert Scruggs online? I am here. Perfect. Uh, great. Can you tell Mr. us what number you're calling from, please? 615, oh. I'm sorry, 615-310-0511. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Scruggs, if you'll state your address and you have a uh, five minutes, if there's any uh, opposition, then you can use another five minutes. So we'll let you yes. proceed. I understand. Thank you. Uh, hi, board. I'm sorry about the confusion earlier. I'm uh, not sure what happened. And as Mr. Lawless, uh, who knows me very well, pointed out, I am techno technologically challenged many times. Um, Anyway, I am here representing Dean and Development. I'm a lawyer. My office address is 2021 Richard Jones Road, Suite 220, Nashville 37215. This uh, situation involves, I think, as Ms. Minton pointed out, five properties. Uh, previously, uh, Mr. Michalinski, who is the uh, principal of Dean and Development, had met with Mrs. Toombs and had a community meeting about putting 14 or 16 units on this property. Uh, received no opposition. In fact, Mrs. Toombs likes the idea. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, in evaluating the situation, there was determination that he could put two units on each of four lots, and then that left the lot to the far right. And one of the things I have to tell you is I have no video, so I can't really uh, point to anything particularly, but uh, you understand what I'm talking about from the video visual that you've seen. At any rate, the uh, the the reason we're here today is to talk about the floor area ratio on the lot to the right. I think it's a zero brick church pike. The lot, as you probably can look at and see, is one that could be developed or could be subdivided into two lots uh, very easily. And if uh, that were to happen, then each of those two lots could have two units, just as the other four lots have. 
and those units could be of pretty much any size they wanted to be um, because of the fact that they would be not considered to be multifamily. Where in MULA, and multifamily requires the FAR uh, requirements, so that's why we're here today. As opposed to doing that, uh, Mr. Mikulinski wanted to see about doing a variance simply because of the fact that if you look at the far right back corner of the property, it drops off uh, fairly well so that there is an issue in construction of the units on the property with uh, subdivision into two different lots. And if you'll also notice on the drawing that was submitted the concept plan, all the units that uh, he's proposing are pushed to the left to try to get away from that issue at the back right corner. And um, uh, he's got a curve in the driveway that uh, kind of avoids that as well. He's trying to basically do this uh, uh, with the terrain that's there and not have too inordinate uh, amount of expense to, to get that done. So uh, that's why we're here today to propose that uh, the FAR regulations, which require in this case that the maximum floor area ratio or floor area on this space be 6,326 feet, which is 60% of the uh, 10,544 square feet of the lot, he wants to be able to do up to 8,000 square feet. Now, Mrs. Toombs, the council uh, person for this area, has written in in support of this uh, proposal, this uh, request for the variance. She personally would like to see these units be in keeping with whatever is already built in the area, the Fern Katie Hill area she refers to. Uh, in other words, the other units in this area, 2,000 square feet each, uh, would be pretty much similar to what he is proposing on this and what we would want to limit the, uh, the size to if we can get this variance. So the hardship in this case is really the terrain, particularly at the back right corner of this particular lot. And again, it could be accomplished in a different way, which would pre present no limitations on the size, but this is one where we can say, we will do a certain size limitation if we can get the variance. And in, and, uh, in doing so, keep these particular units to be the same size or basically the, roughly the same size as the other units that are in the area. And that's it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Scruggs. Uh, any, does uh, any board member have questions for Mr. Scruggs at this time? Okay, I don't see anybody's hand up. Do we have any callers in the queue? We do not. Okay, um, all right, well, let's uh, close the public hearing then and discuss. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, can I ask to reopen the public hearing for one question to Mr. Scruggs? Sure. Yeah, sure. Mr. Scruggs, are you still there? I am here. Okay. Mr. Lawless has a question for you. Mr. Scruggs, could you articulate uh, the hardship you find yourself or your client more accurately in to justify the variance, please? You, I mean, you've listened, I imagine, to the previous discussion by the board, so I don't have to create yeah. something. Sure. I understand your question. Uh, Thanks, so sir. if uh, if Mr. Uh, Michelinski, Dean and Development, were to go in and, and subdivide this property, which should not be an issue, there's plenty of property there to have two lots, given the current uh, situation. The one lot to the far right is going to be dropping off, I wouldn't say precipitously, but uh, immaterially at the back right which is gonna create issues as far as being able to develop the uh, houses that are gonna be built on that lot. By having the zoning variance and having the ability to put four of the houses on, on one lot like we have here, he can push these houses to the left. And again, I, I have no visual that I'm, I'm able to point to or that you can see. I'm just describing what I, I know to be the case. Uh, by the way, my internet's gone and I, <laughs> when, I, when I tried to connect earlier, I pull something out and, and um, I'm basically, the only way I have to communicate now is by cell phone. So anyway, the, uh, the units that uh, are proposed are shoved to the left to be able to accommodate the, the issue that is existing in the back right corner of the property. 
uh, that uh, situation is one that he would have to deal with uh, with the subdivision that he more easily can deal with with the uh, variance. In other words, by getting the variance, he can accommodate that situation, build houses, the same number of houses as you would be able to build with the subdivision, but actually have some limitations on the size of the units because of the fact that with the subdivision, he can build 5,000 square foot houses, let's say, whereas here we're talking about building 2,000 square foot houses. Okay, so so your your hardship is the topography of, of the lots and the location. Yes. Thank you. And, and I hope you didn't, uh, my comment about being technically challenged, you did not take personal offense at from an old friend, right? <laughs> I uh, did not. Thank you, sir. Okay, Will, does it, does, uh, before we close the public hearing, does any other board member have questions for Mr. Scruggs? Okay, we'll close the public hearing and discuss. Uh, well, it, it seems to me like there, the applicant is laying out a, a pretty good case for there being a hardship with respect to the topography. I mean, I don't have a, we don't have a, a contour map um, and that would be helpful, but um, the, the council person supports this and you know, there's no opposition. So I think that has to be accounted for too. Mr. Chairman, do we, I, I thought we had, I thought that was a contour map or sort of a contour map. Am I, mis am I not looking there, at it? There is one in the packet. It's hard to read. It's real hard to read. I, I couldn't see what the lines, but I. That's how. That's why I asked the question. I did, Mr. Chair. No, I'm, I must have missed it. I, I think I see it now. I think it, I just missed it because it is. I still can't read it. Maybe I can blow it up here. I even tried that and couldn't. It blurs out. Ms. Davis, uh, you have your hand up. Ms. Davis, you might be muted. We can't hear you. I am. I'm sorry. Thank okay. you. I'm sorry. Um, I was going to say that I think that there is a hardship in this case. I think the topography and the depth um, and even the map that we're looking at right now, like it, it, the lots, I don't know, it seems like there's a point. It's like a weird shaped triangle. I'm not an architect, but I don't know, the lots, the lots don't look like, there, there seems to be a variance just from looking at the map, just based off of how the shapes of these lots are. So um, in this case, I think the applicant did make a case from the for the variance and like, it is. it was hard for me to read the contour map too, but looking at this map, um, and just where how the interstate sort of runs parallel to it, um, yeah, I think there's an argument for a, a hardship. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Uh, anyone else, Ms. Carpenter? I'll have to say I do better when there's written explanations in our board packet. Um, and for me, I, I'm missing that. And I'm not making the correlation um, as to why there is additional floor area that should be granted because of a topography issue. And maybe I missed the opportunity to ask the applicant that, but maybe some of the other board members, if you you have an idea on that, feel free to, to let me know. Well, would any of the other board members object to uh, us opening, reopening the public hearing so Ms. Carpenter can ask that question directly to the applicant? Yeah. Okay, so there's no objection. So is the applicant, Mr. Scruggs, are you still there? I'm still here, yes. Okay, uh, did you hear Ms. Carpenter's question? I did, yes, I did. Uh, okay. Basically, the, the situation is that uh, with a subdivision, which is certainly something that could be done, probably could be accomplished in a couple of months, uh, any size structure could be built on these properties, two units each uh, lot, on two lots. And the problem is that the units at the back or the unit to the far right would have, and probably both units to the far right in that lot, would have the topography issue that uh, exists that's shown on the, on the topographic map. And uh, 
uh, by doing the variance, Mr. Mikulinski DNM development is basically accommodating the fact that uh, uh, he can't build the same size units or as much as he wants to on those lots. He's willing to accommodate the fact that there are some restrictions and downsize what he could build to make it more in keeping with what's already being built in the area, as Mrs. Toombs points out. So um, he, he basically is trying to reach a compromise uh, based on the fact that he has issues with the topography, uh, but also has the ability to do something much more uh, if he were to try to do the subdivision. Ms. Carpenter, do you have any follow-up for Mr. Scruggs on that? Uh, no, thank, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Scruggs. We'll close the public hearing again and discuss further. Thank you. Any uh, any more comments or discussion? Sign those. Is there a motion? motion. It's my gym motion. Did somebody say they were making a motion? I'll go ahead and make the motion so we can either go up or down with it or we'll just stare at the screen for the rest of the afternoon. I make a motion that we approve the request based on the topographical or the archive, the topography of the uh, uh, of the property. Um, yes. Okay. Is there a second to that motion? This is Newton. I'll second that. Okay. There's a second. Uh, all right. We'll take a roll call vote. Miss Davis. I vote in favor. Mr. Karpinek? In favor. Mr. Lawless? In favor. Mr. Newton? In favor. And I'm in favor, so that, that motion passes and the application for the variance is approved. Okay, we'll move to the next case. Next case to be considered is case 20-252, located at 1220 North 5th Street. Requesting variances from setbacks and the height within the build two zone. It's a, the property is on RM20A and they're proposing a multifamily development. Parts of your map showing the proposed development highlighted in red. Aerial view of the area. Subject property, street views, property across the street. The site plan proposed with the highlighted areas showing the setback zone and a 30 foot height, which is required by the zoning. And here are renderings that they've provided showing the proposed development from the different street views. I believe that the uh, applicant could explain these a little further, but the highlighted areas are what is protruding into the, uh, exceeding the height plane at the, the build to and within the step back zone. Okay, is the uh, applicant uh, ready? I believe I am, can you hear me? We can, if you could state your name and address, please. Sure, uh, Mark Wallace, 340 Wandering Circle. Thanks for hearing me today. Should I just go ahead and start? Sure. Okay, um, I'll, I'll give a quick history and circumstances uh, and then uh, I'm gonna reserve the rest of my time for the architect to discuss it, uh, to get a little more technical if you guys have some more questions. Um, uh, 1220 North 5th, is actually it's an irregular lot on the corner um, of Major Collector Douglas and uh, North Fifth Street. Um, it's zoned RM20A, and as she just described, and with the five-unit density potential, 
Um, we've originally verified the setbacks with the front being uh, at 1220 North 5th, which, which, which puts the uh, rear setback on the left or the west. Um, however, uh, zoning since then has changed that to the orientation being the, the front would be the north along Douglas and where the front would be and then the 20 foot rear setback on the south side um, adjacent to a property on North 5th. Um, that southern 20 foot margin of rear rear boundary would is equates to about 30% of the lot making it really un, unbuildable. We have about uh, eight feet, uh, at least eight feet of topography that slopes down to the west. And we're in a pretty uh, large, in the middle of some very large developments on Lishy and Douglas. And then of course, across the street from us on both sides, both Douglas and North Fifth with multifamily. Um, so there's also, I provided in case anybody needs to see the uh, landscape buffer and uh, the buffer that we chose to put in that's over and above what's required in that 20 feet. And then of course the street trees all around it. But um, uh, so basically um, we now face Douglas with all four units. We've we shrunk it down to four units instead of five. And that was a tight squeeze. Uh, so about a year ago, we asked uh, the BZA to encroach that 20 feet to the south um, for that one unit to get to five feet of a setback instead of 20. And that was denied uh, because it'd be too close to, to the neighbor. And uh, today our ask is regarding that step back that, um, not to be confused with setback, but the step back up at 30 feet height, we have to come over uh, 15 feet basically on three sides of the building. So we basically have a front on three sides of our building, which the architects can talk more uh, intelligently about than I can. But um, this then, um, uh, this really, the, the and I think all the areas in red, yes, do correlate uh, with each other on the map versus the three-dimensional view. If we go to the three-dimensional view, um, we'll see that basically there's slivers and that's what the architect can can talk about. Um, I don't know if John is on the line. Are you, is anybody aware of that or? John, our architect was John Rude? calling in. Is that who yeah. you're? Okay, we're unmuting him. Hello, test one, two. Okay, if you could state your name and address, please. Sure, my name is John Root with Root Architecture and our office address is 753 Alloway Street. Uh, thank okay. you for hearing us. Before you get started, John, you've got two minutes remaining of your first five minutes. Perfect, perfect. I'm sure we'll have some rebuttal as I don't really understand uh, the councilman's uh, uh, um, a position on this case. What you're seeing here is we, we've actually encountered this uh, a lot lately with the, with the A zoning. And uh, what we're talking about specifically is uh, I think in my 11 year tenure at, in my office, we do a lot of infill construction and design. And I think, I don't think I've ever encountered a, a tougher uh, lot than this one that you're looking at right here. It's basically a peninsula that has three front setbacks and it's um, the hardship should be fairly obvious, but what we've tried to do is find a compromise and come up with a reasonable solution that I think everybody can 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 agree to, and so we've we've in, we've in, included that step back on what I'm going to call the north side, and we've included that step back what I'm going to call on the west side, on on in the top right picture on the right, basically that one, and what where we're getting in trouble with is obviously we've got two areas where this red is highlighted in the in the construction, and one being on North Fifth, which. We're, we've actually encountered this a lot on corner lots, and I, I feel like the request is pretty reasonable that we're we're uh, allow we're incorporating the step back on the front of that unit, but not on the side, uh, just because of obvious reasons that it 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 makes it really difficult to get get that um, unit to work. Um, and I also want to note that you know this this developer has gone above and beyond with trying to uh, work with the neighborhood. Uh, and the, the density, we're actually under, we're under the account. We're only doing four units instead of five. And we're actually uh, trying to compromise in other areas on, in the architecture and building to make it blend in. And I think the last point I want to kind of draw everybody's attention to is, is I think in this situation, the context is very important. 
on Douglas across the street, we have a three-story uh, uh, development. And, and on the other side of North Fifth, we have a three-story development. So, and you're looking at this project in scale with the context of everything around it. I believe that we're coming up, we're, we're, what we're presenting here is a reasonable uh, s solution that everybody can um, agree that the hardship is 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 very, very imminent and very dominant. <laughs> and I will reserve any remaining time if I have any left to, to any questions. Thank you. Okay, so we will now be taking uh, calls and I uh, believe we have some in the queue. We do, give us a second. Okay. Now. Hello, my name is Adam Bizard. I live at 1216 North 5th Street. You guys there? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, I'm great. Um, so I am, live at the house to that is adjacent to this building. Uh, we are deeply opposed to variants that are requested. Mr. Bizard, you need to you need to either speak into your phone or get a better better uh, reception because you're you're fading out on us. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll try and talk louder. Uh, uh, this is the variances of being the neighbors are immediately accessible to the lot. Um, the lot, the design in no way matches the neighborhood, uh, and the examples that they are giving are not next to single-family homes, which this development would be. Um, the design is again de determining the hardship, not the lot. The lot has always been that shape, and there have been people living on that lot previously. And yet there have been no other issues in that way. So um, they could easily build two to three spaces on that lot, but they're trying to jam in four and keep coming back with these variances. Um, something the architect just said was that this, this is a reasonable solution that everyone can agree to, and we are not agreeing to that. And he said that the developer has gone above and beyond to work with the neighborhood, and he has in no way gone connected with us. We've lived there for over eight years, and we've had one conversation with him last time he tried to push a design through the ask for these variances step back. And, and now they've added, uh, thank you. They, now they've added the height variances as well. And so as the direct neighbors were asking, the other thing is that intersection is really dangerous coming up from Douglas and uh, Lishy on North Fifth, and it will be blocking all visible uh, views from North Fifth onto Douglas. Um, when you're turning on to Douglas from North Fit. So um, we ask that you deny this request. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, board caller. members, sit tight. We'll have another caller here. Caller, you can speak now. Uh huh. Can you hear me? We can if you can state your name and address, and then you'll have two minutes. Yes, sir. So my name is Cody Ballou. Um, I live at 1212 North Fifth Street. Um, I am calling as a very concerned neighbor. Uh, we have all sort of banded together as a street on this particular issue. Um, this lot in question, um, that's the that the developer has already described it as being difficult, has been that shape since the neighborhood was established. Um, I've lived here almost 10 years now and have seen all of these things being developed and rezoned. Um, it's not the lot's fault that they decided to buy it and try to force this sort of development on that lot size. I can tell you that the rezoning decisions that have been made around us have caused um, all the sunset views to go away. It has caused all the sight lines to be blocked. It has created a, a significant wind tunnel down Douglas Avenue um, that 
all of us neighbors experience between all of these tall um, condominiums that ha have been built on either side of, of Douglas. Um, this lot in question has some of the most established trees of any lot on our, our street. Um, they are trying to build it in such a way that it would uh, 30 seconds remaining. totally eradicate those trees. Um, I don't think that this is appropriate, and I'll use the last few seconds to say that I've been sitting on this call since it started at, at 1 p.m., and the comment about the China virus or the Chinese virus was completely uncalled for and um, is shameful. And I, I don't think that that should have been said during a public hearing by a public hearing. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ballou. I believe we've got another caller in the queue. We do, give us just a second. Caller, you can speak now. Hi, my name is Greg Yankin. Uh, thank you for taking time. To, uh, yes, sir. And if you if you could state your address, and then you'll have two minutes. Okay. My name is Greg Yankin. I live at 1215 North Fifth Street. Uh, I am also another concerned neighbor. Um, the architects' drawings are, are very nice, but I don't believe they accurately represent the true topography or landscape and dynamic of the community and the neighborhood and, and the lot uh, as represented. Um, there are a lot of beautiful trees, uh, as stated, that will be torn down, um, and it looks like there's added um, square footage to the front uh, landscaping that isn't actually represented or, or can't be represented because it would essentially encroach on Douglas and on North Fifth. Um, some other concerns, probably as mentioned in, in various emails as well, um, around the sight lines and with the street safety and public safety overall. Um, but uh, I think the biggest concern is the overall dynamic and change of the community with short-term rentals and um, just overall parking as well. As you can imagine, four units are there. There are eight vehicles. There's little street parking as it is, especially there won't be any street parking on Douglas. Um, they have a small plot of land on North 5th uh, that they could park on, if any. Um, so I believe it would actually change the complete dynamic of the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I believe we have another call. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Address a couple of Caller, you can speak now. Hi, my name is Karen Baldwin. I live at 1227 North 5th Street. Um, I recently purchased the property, um, but I've been in the neighborhood less than a mile away from the property for over 10 years. Uh, before I purchased this, I live in the townhomes directly across the street from where this proposed property is going. And before I, I purchased it, uh, I, knew, I was aware that there was a vacant lot across the street, and I assumed it would be developed. But I researched the owner of the property, emailed them to ask what the plans were, didn't get a response. Um, so I checked into the zoning requirements for the parcel. And since the, um, the existing zoning height and setback requirements are what they are, I based my decision to purchase on the fact that the developer would only be allowed to build in the proper sized building that would roughly fit with the neighborhood architecture. I did not expect that the appeal and build and that they would appeal and the build would be a much larger, okay. uh, more obtrusive property. There are no undue hardships here. Uh, the builder knew what he was buying when he bought it. There was a single family home on the property for decades and nothing about the, the shape or talk off topography uh, prohibits the developer from building multifamily units. Um, this is a 100% financially motivated request. 
uh, the plans that were proposed are not at all, at all in line with the neighborhood architecture. 30 seconds remaining. Okay. Um, our town hall is built tastefully and in line with the time period of the houses. And um, this is not uh, the height variance which cast a large shadow over the property and the surrounding blocks and the street. Um, it would significantly impede the sight lines in an already uh, overly busy street that has a lot of accidents. Um, I, okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. We have another caller we're going to put through. Okay. Hi, this is Allison Bazard, and I'm at 1216 North 5th Street, and I am uh, married to Adam, who called in just a little bit ago. I am directly next to the 1220 lot, it's in question, and I would echo uh, a number of what <clears throat> my neighbors have, have spoken about. I think, um, you know, what, what I, I want to say is that my husband and I purchased this home eight years ago, um, and the neighborhood was was really different. We liked that it was a lot of single family homes. It's been a quiet block. It's been um, a block with close neighbors. And we've seen the neighborhood change and we know that that happens within development. Um, but, but we believe that there needs to be responsible development and uh, building four units on this lot is, is kind of like buying a pair of pants that's three sizes too small and being really upset when you bust out the zipper and try to take it back. Uh, to the store. So, I mean, the, the, the lot size uh, has not changed, as everyone has mentioned. And I think, you know, for my husband and I as direct neighbors, the thing that concerns us the most is, is the height that's now being proposed and just the lack of privacy that we will have um, additionally because of the zoning for this uh, short-term rental. The, the amount of parties that will happen up on that roof deck, I, like we can't even imagine the noise, especially um, hopefully as, as the vaccine works for COVID and, and there are more and more folks coming back to Nashville. So I would just say as the direct neighbors um, being really affected by this, um, we have not. Pardon me? 30 seconds remaining. Thank you. Um, the developer did come speak to us last year when he was trying to push this through, and, and he did come to the house yesterday. I was on a Zoom call and wasn't able to speak with him, but um, I wouldn't say that he had tried to work with the neighborhood on these plans, and so that's um, additionally concerning um, for a neighborhood that has really strong neighbor presence. Um, we, we need a development that, that will be um, built by a, a strong developer that will work with us. So thank you for your time. Thank you. We have another caller. Caller, are you ready to speak? Thank you. My name is Sunny Eaton. I am homeowner at 1227 North 5th Street in Nashville, directly across from 1220, the subject of this um, hearing. I'm an attorney here in Nashville, although, of course, that's not the capacity I'm calling it. The first thing that I would like to address is that there is no hardship here for the developer. Um, simply stating that there's a hardship does not make a hardship exist. It, within the application, the developer provided no evidence for this hardship. There was unit, there were units on this property prior. The only hardship here that exists with from for this developer, I would like to refer back to what Ms. Davis said in a prior hearing, were created by this developer, by their own plan. There is nothing stopping the developer from building two or three units. It is simply profit that is driving this developer to want to put so many units and at such a height. I would also like to point out that the comparisons that the developers provided to this panel are really not comparable at all. One of them provided with an application is not even in this zip code, this neighborhood or on this side of the river. The other one is not contiguous to any single single story home. 
In fact, our townhome development across the street is not contiguous to any single-story home. They're simply not the same. What this developer is attempting to do is crowd both the sidewalk and its neighbors to the left. The development across the street that's previously received a variance does not butt up against any other properties. has ample parking. This one provides no parking. We already have a street parking problem. Additionally, it would create a sightline problem. It is already dangerous. We are on the opposite corner. We see many accidents happen here because of the amount of street traffic. Adding this sightline block will make it incredibly dangerous for us every single time we pull out of our property or anyone down the street. The developer has made no attempt, despite what they've said earlier, to communicate with us as neighbors or make any compromises whatsoever. In fact, this developer previously made a bad faith communication to the set of neighbors directly adjacent. Time's up. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> do we have any additional calls in the queue? We do. Uh, how how many do we have? How many do we have in the queue? We have two. Okay, so I, it, I would say to the second caller that we've heard now from six uh, people in the neighborhood, I think I, I can speak for all the board members that we, we understand fully that the neighbor's concerns here and we welcome anyone to call in, but we just ask that um, you try not to cover the same ground that's been covered by your other six neighbors. Okay, caller, you can speak now. Thank you. Um, hi, this is uh, Council Member Sean Parker. I live at 108 in that court. Um, uh, yeah, I just wanted to clarify um, and kind of echo the concerns of some of my neighbors here. So, you know, I, I, I don't personally see a real hardship in this case. Um, again, the topography, the, the, the geometry of the site was known um, uh, at the time of purchase. Um, as well, I'm, I'm a little wary of, you know, granting variances on the, on hardship grounds in these cases because I mean, what it what it feels like at times happening in cases like these is a person, a developer is looking through the, you know, the bulk tables and they say, okay, well, what could I do if I bump that up by 25 percent? Or what could I do if, you know, I got you know 35 percent here, um, you know, the, the step back or, or or whatever the variance is. I mean. This is, um, you know, the, the, the drawings are quite handsome, but I'm sure that complying with the zoning for the site, they could also come up with a, a handsome design and product. I, I just, I don't think that the, I don't see a hardship case for stretching the boundaries of the zoning district. And I do not believe that there is a hardship here because they have come up with a design uh, that seeks to stretch those boundaries. And, 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 and that's all I've got for you, board. Thank you so much for being here all afternoon. Uh, thank you, council member. We're checking with the last caller to see if they actually want to speak with the board at this point. Give us a second. Okay. Caller, you can speak now. Hi, um, my name is Devin Rush, and I live at 1214B North 5th Street. Um, so I'm about one house down from 1220 North 5th Street, um, and I'm calling in opposition to this request. Um, I just want to echo everything my neighbors have said um, and also just add that um, in reviewing the Metro Board of Zoning Appeals application, um, it's states that the board cannot grant a variance based solely on inconvenience to the applicant or solely on a financial consideration um, because this lot has been this, um, the geometry has been the same as this lot um, since forever. Um, it seems to me that this developer is feeling um, inconvenient and wants to maximize their financial gain. So I don't believe that that um, should be considered a hardship. 
Um, okay. That's all. Thank you. I'm sorry. Were you finished? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Thank you very much. We don't uh, have any more calls. Okay, very good. So we will now, how much time does the applicant have left? Five minutes. That okay. Total time. So the applicant has five minutes left. Applicant, you're on. Hey folks, is this uh, time, is this the rebuttal time? Is that, is it? Um, yes, um, you have five minutes for rebuttal. Okay. Uh, some a lot of statements there that that weren't necessarily unfair that, that were, I, my view were unfair um i think that we just heard a case with topography as an issue that's that's one of many um this lot does have three three fronts and we're trying to do the best we can i'm going to leave this to my architect in a little bit i have reached out to neighbors i've knocked on doors i've tried to reach people i've tried to reach our, our councilmen um i've i've left uh color 3d images to, to explain this and we're, we're absolutely doing our best and no we're not parking on the street we're uh, putting garages there so there will there'll be no impact on streets um, I'm less than difficult I'm probably one of the most available people to get a hold of uh, if if it's even attempted I, I, I just sorry about this I'm just trying to do my best with the notes I took um, so I think some of your neighbors concerns are that what I'm hearing is they believe you could do two or three units and comply with the code, but you're you're pushing it to four, and the councilman has the same problem, which is that he just believes it's too intense for the site. So can you speak to those? I mean, why, why isn't this? Sure. It's a, it's an odd-shaped yeah. lot. We all get that. But Mark, do you want me to ask this sure? question? Or? Yeah, go ahead. You can take right. the question. Yeah, go ahead, John. Sure. Go ahead, buddy. I mean, the zoning is what the zoning is, so I, I'm, I'm not – quite sure why we're talking about density when the, when the zoning allows five units and we're only asking for four why that's even coming into question um the one one issue with the additional hardship obviously the lot shape is creating a large of it large part of it uh it was mentioned that's eight foot of drop from one side or the other we do have a topography issue but we're, we're working pretty well with that uh, the other issue is we're having to give away about 10 feet, plus or minus, don't quote me on that, I don't have the site plan right in front of me, of right-of-way dedication due to the transit plan with Nashville and with Douglas. So a lot of the comments about blocking views from the intersection, I don't know that that's completely relevant because what they're looking at on a site plan is a sidewalk that's actually in our, in our property significantly back away from the uh, new intersection. So I think that sh should be considered it's not always considered, uh, but our, our development has actually pushed off uh, the street quite a bit to, ac to accommodate the new sidewalk requirements. So I don't know why density is a big question here. Um, um, you know, it, the zoning allows three stories, it allows five units, that's not in question. Um, the 25% number that the councilman had mentioned, I have no idea where that number is coming from. Uh, you can see in the the graphic images that we're showing you that that's nowhere near 25% of our square footage. So I'm not sure where that number is coming from. Um, Mark, well, I'll the, hand it back over to you. The fact that the zoning allows a certain number, it, it, it is, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but the fact is, it beca the, the fact that you want to build four units matters because you're asking for variances. So at any rate, Mr. Newton has a question for you too. So I believe Mr. Newton... Yes. Uh, so how, how big are these units in each one? Um, I believe they average in size from 1,600 square feet to about 1,850 to 2,000, I believe. Mark, is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. So, I mean, <laughs> not counting garage, the garages eat up a lot of it. Yeah, each garage is 400 square feet. That's not counted. Okay. Right. So, if you... Presumably, if you, if you had, if you use smaller units, you might could fit the four or five along without needing the variance. Is that reasonable? And you, then we have to park on the street. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any other questions from the board before we, uh, does that going to have any time left in rebuttal? Yeah, he has three minutes. Okay. So, uh, applicant, you still have three minutes. Mark, take, take it away. <laughs> I think I've, I okay. think I've tried to answer well, they, enough they, questions. 
Yeah, I mean, I think we've, we've done our best. I, I think the, the the overall thought of this is that um, the the step backs have been definitely addressed uh, as, as good as we think it's, it's even possible. We are taking a hit significantly. We do have a, a hardship that was incurred after the after this in the way of uh, zoning has has changed the way that we that they uh, looked at the front versus the rear setback. It changed from North Fifth and it changed. It went to Douglas, and that then immediately gave the only adjacent neighbor we have. Uh, there isn't, and it was only one adjacent neighbor. That's to our south, and they have a full 20-foot setback with a lot of landscaping and a large fence. So, I mean, there's um, there was a lot of comments about that hardship, but, but bottom line is that yes, the circumstances did significantly change since since then. So we're trying to do our best with less density than what's allowed and try to park them all on site with, without crowding the streets. So that's it for me. I, I'm, I'll, I'll follow Dwayne's, uh, Dwayne's words before is I don't think I can talk anymore. So thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh Unless there are any questions for uh, Mr. Wallace or Mr. Ruth, we'll close a public hearing. Does anybody have any further questions for the applicants? Okay, we'll close the public hearing and discuss. Um, I I see that it is an odd shape lot, but I, I guess what, I mean, it's definitely a unique size lot, but what I'm struggling with is, what the neighbors are struggling with is, it just seems to me like there can be um, code compliant building done. You just have to reduce the number of units or um, I guess reduce the size of the units. Um, that's my initial thought. I certainly want to hear from everybody else. So, Mr. Ms. Karpinek. Uh, sure, I ag agree with you on that. Um, and I do want to compliment the applicant for doing a great job with ex in these um, renderings, diagrams, explaining um, the step back. And it's really clear, and I'm, I'm thankful to have this graphic. Um, but I do agree with you that um, it does seem that there's a different solution to, to building on this site that would be code compliant. Okay, thank you, Ms. Karpinek. Any any other Hi, board members? Mr. Yep. Mr. Pepper, this is Ms. Shanti Davis. Oh, hey, Ms. Davis. Um, hey, so I'm sorry I didn't raise my hand, but okay. I remember this case from earlier this year, and I think that was one of the first times I got to say that certain horses aren't made for certain courses. <laughs> and I remember denying this parent's request because of the issues that the neighbors raised. I think this time the applicant did a better job of sort of manufacturing um, sort of a hardship because as someone who lives in the area and who drives by this intersection frequently, I can tell you that this lot is no different than any of the other lots in the area and that it's about 0.2 of an acre. And so some of the issue is what they're trying to accomplish on this lot. And I think this case is very similar to the other case in which we denied the variance. Now, I will be intellectually honest and say, that I understand that there are three front setbacks, but that orientation didn't seem to prohibit the previous home that sat because it faced North Fifth, and that was the orientation of the home, so that worked. I understand that they have this entitlement, and I understand that they, sh and I think that they should take advantage of their entitlement and build more because that's what it allows. But I think what they're asking us to do just goes well beyond the bounds of what the purpose of granting a variance is supposed to be. And I'm done talking. Okay, thank you, Ms. Davis. Um, and there's also been a, been a, a, a quite a bit of, I think, well-articulated uh, neighbor opposition to this. Um, so anybody else or anybody with a motion? Uh, Okay, I, I'm, I will make a motion that the application be denied. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, we'll do a vote. Uh, Ms. Davis, how do you vote? In favor. Uh, Mr. Karpinek? In favor. Mr. Lawless? In favor. Mr. Newton? In favor. And I vote in favor, so that motion passes with five votes. So 
uh, thank you, applicant, for a very good presentation and uh, good luck. And we will move on to the next case. But before we do, I think it's time for another 10 minute break. Uh, it's now five o'clock, so let's take uh, about 10 minutes. Go Command okay. Central. Case 20 2253, located at 2402 Oakwood Avenue. Uh, the applicant is requesting a variance from the side setback requirements within the, a single family zone district to build a proposed garage addition. Okay, is the applicant? Oh, I'm sorry, you won't finish with your presentation. I'm going to go the slides first. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm getting a little jumpy. <laughs> Overview of the parcel map showing the, the parcel zoning and aerial, aerial view. The subject property. Street views and the property across the street. Here's the site plan of the proposed development showing the garage uh, addition to the side of the property. There's a required five foot side setback and they're requesting a reduction to a one foot side setback the applicant can now address the board please state your name and address and then present your case hi my name is joshua krebs um, i'm representing myself and my fiance sophia kreisa uh, we live here at 2402 oakwood avenue um, and yes we are requesting a variance so as you said so we can build over that five foot side setback um, in order to provide enough space to make it worth building at all. Um, if if we were not able to go over that side setback, we would only be able to build out about eight feet from the house, which would significantly reduce the interior square footage and especially along, as you can see on the side plan, along the side of the house, it would be a pretty narrow space and would ultimately reduce the functionality and utility of the of the garage. Um, we want to build out, as you can see, about 12 feet. Uh, and at that point, granted, it's still over the, set, uh, the setback, but um, not quite all the way to that one foot line would be if this were to be approved. So we're not quite getting all the way to the edge of the prop, uh, property line. But um, as far as our neighborhood, we haven't received any kind of opposition to this uh, this proposal. We have spoken to both of our immediate side neighbors, uh, including the one who's the, uh, whose house is on the side where we want to build the garage, and they both uh, have shown support uh, towards towards the idea. And um, well, I, honestly. Uh, we've been here since one o'clock and I, I, I feel a little silly because everybody else had a lot more to say, but <laughs> um, that's, that's, that's about it for us. Uh, Thank you. And it's, it's, it's quantity, not quality. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Krebs. Thank you. Uh, okay. Somebody's okay. Somebody, I believe, has a television or something going in the background because so I'm getting some echo, but I think it's gone now. Okay, do we have any callers in the queue? Oh, Ms. Karpinek, I think you may have had a question for me. <laughs> I did, I okay. did. Um, thank you for hanging on with us since 1 o'clock. I'm sure this is probably not what you wanted to do with your day. Um, and my question was, I think I read something in the packet about you were building on an existing slab. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Thank you. I was in my notes and I forgot to mention this. The, <laughs> the, there is an existing slab that's uh, there. We, we don't want to go any further past it. Um, granted, it does, it does go right up to the property line by the, by the back of it. But mm -hmm. um, that is where we want to put it. Okay, I have a question for the zoning department, um, if I may ask about, and I might be getting ahead of myself, so maybe let's, um, maybe we should take a call if there are any, and I can ask later. We don't have anyone in the queue. 
Okay. Okay. Then if I'll ask the question. Um, this is getting very close to the neighbor's property line, and this is more a building code issue. Um, so usually you have to keep a building at least three feet from a neighbor's property line without having that wall rated. Um, and so if this was to be approved today, would a plans examiner um, who would look at the building code um, have to look at these have to look at this and advise on that? Uh, the actual fire marshal review would determine if it was allowed or not and what additional fire rating would be required. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Ms. Karpinek. Uh, and I've got a question for the applicant too. Uh, Mr. Krebs, what's the existing slab there for? Is there a structure on it now? Uh, there's not, it, it, it kind of just feeds from the driveway uh, around the house on like to the concrete back porch area. And there is a covered back porch. Um, so uh, to be honest, I'm not sure what the intention was initially when it was built. Uh, we actually just purchased this house about uh, maybe almost two years ago, a year and a half. Um, but yeah, no, there's nothing existing on it except for the back portion that's covered by like a portico. Okay. And does the slab, is it also, uh, is it located where you're proposing the building to be located or is it, does it not encroach on the setback? It, it does. Uh, it, okay. Um, and that, yes. So that the, it, it goes almost up to the property line, I believe, um, at, the, at its closest point. Um, so is it going to be, is it essentially going to be, I think you must have, somebody must have a TV or something on the background because I'm getting echo, but is the existing building going to, it's going to be just built right on that slab. That's going to be the, the ground floor, the slab. Uh, yes, sir. I mean, well, We'll probably put some kind of like uh, garage type flooring down once it's on there. But we're not gonna we're not gonna tear it up or anything, and we're we're not gonna extend it. Okay. Any you don't have to pour any additional concrete. I don't believe so. No. Okay. Um, thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Any uh, more? Any more questions from the? Board members for the applicant. Mr. Pepper, this is Mr. Newton. I have, I have a question. Okay. Um, the the 12 feet that you see that you're uh, building out there, is that including the, uh, the roof overhang of the uh, of the proposed garage? Um, to be honest, I hadn't thought about that. I need to, I'll have to ask my architect, but um, I don't, I, I think it does. Yeah, because I don't think we could go any further than that, honestly, without um, going over to the, uh, over the actual property line on the back end. Okay, uh, I would I confirm that, so make sure you're aware. Yeah. Okay, any other questions for the applicant? Okay, being none, we'll close the public hearing and discuss. The, um, you know, there being an existing slab there and the applicant's not um, pouring any additional concrete or um, he's basically just building on what they have. In the past, we have, we have been uh, recognized that as a hardship and have, you know, permitted those kind of variances. Um, it's a four foot variance from five feet to one feet. So it's, you know, it's not the biggest request in the world. It's not the smallest. Um, so those are kind of my thoughts. Um, I'm uh, like to hear from everybody else. Ms. Davis. Mr. Pepper, um, I was able to rejoin at the beginning of Ms. Minton's presentation for this case, I was gonna say that I agree with you. 
So if you made that a motion, I would support it unless someone else has a varying opinion. Okay, thank you, Ms. Davis. Yeah. Okay, wow. Can I just ask one quick question? In, in sure. Terms, it's still, it's still got to get rated by the fire marshal, correct? Yes, that's the way I understand it. Okay. That is correct, yes. Okay, thanks, Lisa. And the fact that we're approving it doesn't mean that the fire marshal will approve it. Oh, absolutely. I'll make a motion that we approve the uh, the application. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. There's a motion and a second. Any any further discussion before we vote? Okay, uh, Ms. Davis, how do you vote? In favor. Ms. Karpinek? In favor. Mr. Lawless? In favor. Mr. Newton? In favor. And I vote in favor of that motion passes. So um, applicants, your variance has been approved. Uh, thank you for the presentation and, and for doing it a couple of minutes what you could have taken 10 minutes to do but you didn't so we appreciate that all right next case the next case is case 2020 255 located at 618 brentwood east drive and it's a variance request from the 500 foot distance requirement from, from a residential property line for a proposed LED message board within the SCR district. The, re the request is for a 206 foot setback. Okay, is the applicant here? I'm gonna go through the slides and- Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still jumpy. <laughs> I've had too much caffeine to keep going, so. <laughs> Are you the parcel in relation to the neighboring properties? Aerial view. Again, this is 618 Brentwood. So it's, it has the red marker on it to show you its relationship to the other properties. There's, there's the subject property. Street views in both directions and view across the street from the property. Here's their site plan with the proposed location of the sign. Um, I believe it is a single face pole sign with LED features. And there's the proposed sign. And now the applicant can address the board. They need to please state their name and address and then present their case. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. If you can state your name and address. All right, my name is uh, Bishop Frederick Barr, address 618 Brentwood East Drive, Nashville, Tennessee, 37211. Okay, Mr. Barr, you've got a total of five minutes and then you have uh, you can re you have five minutes for, for rebuttal if you need it. Okay, also uh, we have our, our attorney, I believe he's on, he's online as well. Okay, which one of you wants to speak first? Sean, are you on? Mr. Henry, can you hear us? Okay, Mr. Barr, why don't you go ahead and then if Mr. Henry, uh, we'll give him another chance to weigh in too. Okay, all right, thank you, uh, Chairman Taylor and board members. On behalf of uh, myself and the Life Church International, owner of the uh, subject property, please accept this a letter and exhibits as evidenced in support of the sign height variance. This property is part of the regional shopping center zoning district SCR surrounding the commercial intersection of Ohio Boulevard and Nolensville Pike. The property is tucked away on Brentwood East Drive. It does not have a ground sign. Patrons and visitors uh, searching for Life Church International cannot see it from the two uh, arterial streets. Uh, Life Church International knows that most of its traffic comes from Nolensville Pike and proposes a single face pylon sign oriented uh, to that area. A 19 feet 6 inch digital display sign would not only 
uh, identify its location to Pastor Byers, but will enable Life Church to inform the community of its worship services, food drive events, and frequently carried out from its on-site food service operation, where we give out hundreds of meals uh, of food uh, every week. The sign location is 220 feet from the rear of the property line, abutting a residentially zoned property which is uh, the Knowles apartment homes. At this distance, the sign code allows an eight foot tall digital sign and the view of which it will be blocked by standard sized vehicles, not to mention the over uh, increasing height of vans, trucks and SUVs. A 19 foot, uh, six foot uh, inch tall sign provides minimum visibility clearing, allowing for a full message display to be seen over the top of most cars and trucks on the road. Meanwhile, the nearest unit of the Knowles apartment homes will be approximately 515 feet from the pr proposed sign to the extent the sign structure will be visible to that res uh to, to the resident they will only see the the blank back side of the signage because it will face each eastward away from the apartments towards nolensville pike importantly the freeman web company which is the owner of the nose apartment and they have expressed in writing uh no objection and this proposal is also uh, the email that they sent is attached. Based upon the review standards of the variances in section 17.40.370, please consider the following facts applying to each uh, criteria. A, physical characteristics of the property. The exceptional shape of this property is unique for Brentwood East Drive properties. The front of the property is the shortest dimension, which the two sides of the rear lens much longer. The driveway is shared by medical office Brentwood uh, East Pediatrics, creating land use uh, uh, identity confusion. The street slopes 10% towards Nolensville Pike, creating a visibility challenge for low signs. Surrounding businesses include the fast food service, a bank, two tire services, a gas station, a paint store, not customary neighbors for a religious institution. These businesses tend to dissuade a passing motorist from gra uh, grasping the fact that Life Church is here. B, a unique characteristics, the specific condition. Bishop Barr? Yeah, yes. hey, Bishop Barr, this is Sean Henry. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, go go right ahead. Okay. You, yeah, I hear you now. Yes, sir, if I may. So, sorry about that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Board of Zoning Appeals, Sean Henry, 315 Dedrick Street. I could not find my mute button on my phone, uh, so I could hear everything you all were saying. Uh, appreciate, uh, really, uh, Bishop Barr's coverage of the paper of the letter that I sub submitted yesterday and we have attached to that the very site plan that you see on the screen now as well as some additional uh, photographs of the site but Bishop Barr has has done a very good job of highlighting uh, what I had put in those two pages and we'll we'll just because we put that in writing we'll dispense with having to go through the remainder of these criteria but this property certainly satisfies that criteria. And I think what it's, what's really important for you to hear is from Bishop Barr and uh, relative to the purpose of this sign. Uh, the services that they offer, uh, I think is critically important, particularly where you have a Chick-fil-A directly across the street that's not open on Sunday as, as indicated in the signs. And Bishop Barr absolutely provides uh, you know some additional food service for his congregation. Uh, as as well as new members that he's trying to attract into his uh, into his flock. So, Bishop, would you would you share a little bit more about how how your congregation operates there? Yes. Can I um, interrupt really quick? You have five minutes remaining, but there are callers in the queue, so I just wanted to let you know that so you can decide how you want to use your time. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Has the first five minutes been used? Yes. Okay, so what we'll do, uh, Mr. Henry and Mr. Barr, is we'll take the calls. You still have five minutes after we take the calls. Okay. So uh, are the calls, how many calls do we have in the queue? One. Okay, so let's take that. My name is Rodney Jarvis. I'm just um, the sign company. I'm not in opposition to it. I was just 
I was on the phone in case they had any questions that came up that I could answer. So. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Jarvis. Uh, thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Henry, Mr. Barr, you still have five minutes. There's really nothing to rebut. There was no opposition, but if you uh, feel like there's something else you need to say, let us know. I think, uh, Mr. Henry, your materials are very good, and uh, you both filled us in pretty well. Yeah, the only the only thing that I would want to emphasize is that the the separation of a digital sign. I hope there's a lot of static, so I hope you can hear. Yeah, me. Somebody must have a TV on in the background, or a com yeah, or a computer. So they need to shut that off. All right, go ahead, Mr. Henry. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, the only thing I want to emphasize is that the the regulation that we're asking to vary is based on the proximity of residentially zoned property, which is, when you look at this slide here, it's on the south side. The adjacent property to the south is the Knowles Apartment Homes. That property is owned and managed by Freeman Webb. Freeman Webb has acknowledged in writing and we've attached it as exhibit three that they have no objection to this sign. Uh, and and um, and importantly, uh, as as Bishop Barr mentioned, this sign's going to face to the east, and it's only one sided. So the orientation of the sign is to Nolansville Pike, to the commercial section, not towards a residential section. And and we've also measured from this dot where the sign will go to the nearest residential unit in the apartment complex is over 500 feet, like 515 feet. So. We, we think we think the purpose of the regulation is being satisfied given the distance separation between the sign and a residential unit, even though the residential zoned boundary is running right along the back of this property. Okay, uh, that's a great point. Thank you for making that. Uh, okay, we will, if any, does anybody have any questions for Mr. Henry or Bishop Barr? Okay, we'll close the public hearing and uh, move into a discussion. Uh, I'll be glad to start. I think this is a, a really unique piece of property. Uh, there, There's not any opposition. Uh, I think Mr. Henry made a really good point about the fact that there actually are 500 feet from the nearest apartment, as I understand it. Um, so I think that uh, it meets it satisfies me that there's a, a hardship and this is a unique piece of property. Uh, so that's my thought on it. Anybody else? Did I understand that they were not going to have the sign sort of illuminating in the direction of the apartment? That's what I understood. We can ask Mr. Henry. We can open the public hearing up to ask Mr. Henry about that again. Mr. Pepper, he said it's to the east towards Nolensville Pike, so that would not be in the direction okay. of the apartments. So no need to open up the public hearing. Okay, that's what I, I thought too. Thank you. All right. Um, anybody else, board members? Well, I will make a motion that we approve the variance. I'll second it. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, I'll move to a vote. Ms. Davis? In favor. Ms. Corkenack? In favor. Mr. Lawless? In favor. Mr. Newton? In favor. And I'm in favor, so that passes with five votes. Um, thank you, applicant, and uh, we will move to the next case. The next case, case 2020-256, located at 5041 Brerwood Drive, is requesting a variance from the side setback requirements for a proposed 1,900-square-foot um, detached garage. The required setback, side setback is 10 feet, and they are requesting a five-foot reduction to allow for a five-foot side setback variance within the RS-20 zoning district. Here's the RS-20 parcel. An overview. I believe that the existing driveway that you see, um, which connects to their pool, 
is being used for the proposed uh, new garage. The applicant can verify that as well. There's a subject property, street views in both directions, and the parcel across the street. Here's the proposed site plan showing the existing house, existing drive, and the proposed garage with pool house. The applicant can now address the board. They need to state their name and address and then present their case. Hello, this is Ryan and Rebecca Bitzer, 5041 Briarwood Drive. We're both present. Hello. Um, it, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we're trying to, to uh, by the way, I have so much respect for what you guys do now. Um, amazing. Uh, but, I'm, but I'll keep moving on. We'd like to build a garage and um, we've got a sewer running through the back uh, part of our lot, and it's a skinny, you know, it's one of these skinnier lots. So we're trying to build a two-car garage, um, and in order to have enough room, we need to go over five feet, as, as you can see. Uh, we, we, have, we addressed both our neighbors in person because that's the, the right thing to do. Um, there, there is some discussion over a tree, uh, as you can see. Uh, the tree that comes up near the front of the garage, of the proposed garage. Um, we've, we're trying to come up with solutions because, you know, there is a chance that this tree could die. Um, we don't know that, but it, it's always a, a chance. So uh, we've offered to, to you know, start, start plant a new tree next to it in case that happens. So if in five years uh, this tree dies, we at least are, uh, you know, ahead of the game. So pretty... Uh, I think that's it. So let me know if you have so, uh, Sure, uh, Mr. Fitzer, question. So the pool is not, it's not existing right now. That's part of what you want to build too? Uh, no, the pool's already there. Okay, that's important. Okay, that's why you can't, you're you're already blocked by the pool. Correct. Essentially. Okay, that's, that's very helpful. Okay. Um, board members, any questions? Okay, do we have any callers in the queue? We do not. Okay. Mr. Pepper, I had, a, I had a question. Sure, okay. Um, so is this a one-story or a two-story? Because um, building that the, you're, the, you're doing here. Sure, it's, it's a one-story building. Okay. And I, I, I read in one of the things that said office above, so that's why I was, I was curious whether it was one or two stories. That yeah. garage below and office above. That was the original dream, but uh, I don't think we can do that. So, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thanks for clarification. So, uh, uh, I have another question too. Is it just not looking at the site plan? You can't. And maybe it's just because I don't read site plans very well. Uh, so there's not another five feet to give. You can't move the pool another five feet and then the building another five, the proposed building another. Wait, the pool's not in. The pool's already in, correct? Yeah, we bought the house okay. with the, with the right, pool. I'm sorry. I, I, had a, I had a momentary lapse of total forgetfulness. The pool's in, so that's as... That's far as you can go because of the pool. So, all right, sorry about that. It's quarter till six and <laughs> <laughs> my, already, my, my usually dull mind is even duller. So, okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Pepper, uh, I have another question. Sure. Um, have you looked, I mean, it looks like there's a pretty good amount of pool deck around it at the park closest to the driveway. Have you considered, because uh, I know your neighbors mentioned the uh, in their opposition letter, they mentioned the tree and trying to avoid that. And I know that that's a big uh, thing for Mr. Wallace. Um, so I, what I would ask is, is, is it, have you considered trying to shift that front portion of it uh, towards the pool a little bit uh, to avoid that, that tree some or... Uh, we looked at it, it makes, it makes the alleyway pretty tight uh from the side of the garage to the pool okay uh, which you can do it but it 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 really cuts it down so it, it looks weird okay uh, gotcha all right mr Thanks. chairman this may interrupt 
We have someone um, on the line that would like to address the board. Okay, uh, well, let's take the call. Okay. You can speak now. I'm Margie Connor, 2918 Davis Avenue. Okay, ma'am, uh, you have two minutes. If this uh, property that you are showing now, if the garage does not block anybody's view and is not on anybody else's property, uh, I would be in favor of letting this uh, person build his garage. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, applicant, do you have anything else to add? Uh, I do not. Okay. Chair. We'll close the public Mr. hearing. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, Mr. Yep. Chair. Mr. Go Chair. ahead, Mr. Lawless. Uh, just to the applicants, um, what are the trees sort of where you're, you're the very last one closest to the proposed garage? What type of tree is it? You don't mind? Um, I, I think it's a maple. Okay. So, so they're maples. It's not a hackberry. Okay. No. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, one neighbor wrote in and said it was a very mature maple. I, I want to say it's at least a 50 year old tree or, or yeah, at least, yeah, that size of tree. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, we'll close the public hearing unless there are any more questions. Um, so we'll close the public hearing and discuss. I, uh, I, I see the, you know, the issue created with the existing pool. I, I kind of, I uh, thought, um, uh, Mr. Newton had a good line of questioning about, is it still possible even with the pool there? Uh, to move the the to be built structure closer to the pool, I'd really have no problem with this the way it is. I, I am like Mr. Lawless. I'm sure I'm, I am. I think a a very mature maple giving it an additional five feet could be the difference between it making it another hundred years or it not. And um, I, you know, it looks to me like where the existing building is going to be built. It's it's going to, I'm not a uh, tree scientist, but it seems like it's going to be really close and could possibly kill that tree. So those are, those are my thoughts on it. I, I mean, the tree is really my only concern. I think there is a hardship created by the, the uh, significant sewer line easement in the back of the property. But at any rate, I'd like to hear what everybody else has to say. Yeah. Ms. Karpinek. Yeah, I'm concerned with that tree as well. And I'd be willing to grant a variance for a certain amount of the new structure. But as it gets closer to that tree, I don't think we should grant it. And I don't know how to determine that distance without seeing a floor plan of the new proposed garage and pool house. So I feel uncertain now about voting in favor of it without that additional information. Okay. Uh, and I feel kind of the same way. And I, I wonder if it, if the solution might be uh, a deferral to come back with it with another site plan. That's that's a, th a thought. Um, anybody else? I'm and not being an architect and, and having the expertise of at least two members of our our group. I can't tell how wide the entrance way of the proposed addition is i mean from going over towards the line and i'm not stating it probably pretty very clearly but 
you know, he, his, he, did I just miss it when I was? Surely Mr. Law was just sick. Thank God for architects. Because it looks like by doing the construction and putting the stuff in there, you're going to mess with mature tree roots, which I don't think you're supposed to do. And like, okay, it's just under 25 feet is what it looks like based on the scale they have on here. Okay, so it's a two car. Two car garage, yeah. Yeah, okay. So it could be a little bit less, but still, and we can't take it up the other side because it's the existing driveway. I'm going to assume. Yeah, that's reasonable. All right. I mean, the only way, as Ms. Carpenter said, I kind of alluded to, is, is trying to find a way that's not a drip line of the tree or it's less than a drip line of the tree. So, um, um, I don't know. Without, like she said, without seeing how this is laid out, you know, I, can, I, I don't know how we could judge that really right now. Yeah. If, you, if my experts can't figure it out, I can guarantee you I can't. <laughs> Uh, so it sounds like this is something that a few of us at least have concerns about. I'm wondering if, and I can certainly open the hearing back up and ask the applicant if they'd be willing to defer it. I think I might be more comfortable with um, seeing a, a site plan that shows what they can do in, in terms of getting further away from this tree. Um, how does that strike other board members. I think it's a capital suggestion, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you. That's a <laughs> that's high praise indeed. So especially uh, at almost six o'clock to get high praise. <laughs> okay. uh, so let me uh, if I can open the hub uh, let me let me ask the applicant, are you still there? Yes sir. Okay, so it looks like, you know, we can we can put this to a vote. It looks like it's you're not gonna get um, a variance approved. Would you be willing to defer it and uh, come back to us with a a plan that shows you know what you can do in terms of getting away from this tree? And I think Mr. Carpenter had something too. Yes, I was um, interested in a floor plan, not necessarily a, a site plan because that's what we have here, but a floor plan that showed what was going into the space. Um, so we understood that more and we understood more the need for it to be so close to the tree. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that it doesn't necessarily be as close to this tree as it's as it's shown. And that maybe when the floor plans worked out, that'll become hopefully um, evident or an option. Or or perhaps they could get some type of arborist to give us a something that says it wouldn't affect it. And I'm that's a big tree, guys. This will yeah, be it is, it, it, and, and a maple tree is a very you know desirable tree. Um, oh yeah. So um, the is the uh, applicant? Are you willing to defer this? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Um, our next meeting uh, is, I'm, I'm going to ask command control. Um, January 7th. Does January 7th work or is that too close to the holidays and New Year? Do you want to push it out further? Uh, I think we can make it work. Okay, there's, okay, so we'll uh, close the public hearing and I will make a motion that we defer this case until January 7th. Second. Okay. Uh, all in, let me, I'll do a roll call vote. Ms. Davis. In favor. Ms. Carpenter. I'm going to be in favor and I'm going to ask that this be placed towards the front of the docket next meeting so they don't have to listen for <laughs> three or five hours like they have been today. Okay. That's a great suggestion. Um, mm -hmm. I think that can be done. Uh, yeah, and we also thank um, the applicant. They've been very kind today. I'd like to. <laughs> yeah, to, to listen to us for five hours. <laughs> um, 
Mr. Lawless, how do you vote? Yes. Okay, Mr. Newton? In favor. And I vote in favor, so it's deferred until January 7th. Thank you, applicant, for your patience, and, and we will um, do what we can to get you moved up in the docket next time around so you don't have to wait. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next case, case 2020-257, located at 6005 Dana Way, is an item D appeal to construct an addition to a non-conforming structure within the IWD district. The request and a variance for the existing storage facility, which was constructed at the reduced 12.56 foot rear setback and their proposed addition at that same setback. Here's the subject property. There's an overview of the property. Street view of the subject. Views down both directions of the street and the property across the street. So the, the proposed building was constructed at, like I said, at the reduced setback and they're proposing an addition and they wanted to keep it in line with that same setback. So the, the appellant can now address the board and they'll need to state their name and address and then present their case. Appellant, are you there? You might need to unmute. I think the appellant's been being eaten by a shark. Appellant, you might need to unmute. We can't hear you. Almost better than Mr. Scruggs is. Uh, <laughs> I spoke too soon. Uh, do we have any? Uh, uh, do we have any? Uh, well, let's let's uh, open this up. Do we have any opposition that's going to call in? I'll just tell the board, I read through this case and I, I, you know, I think the appellant obviously would have things to add to it, but um, it seemed to me like a, 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 a pretty solid case for a variance. So we can either come back to this case or we can see if there's any opposition and then discuss it. Mr. Karpinek. Yeah, I would agree. It looks like it's an item D, so it's a non-conforming structure. And I didn't think the addition was more non-conforming than what was existing. And I'm probably saying that backwards. I probably need to say it a different way, but I think everyone gets the gist. I got it. And if I can get it, I'm sure everybody else did. So. <laughs> I know there's a certain way to word item D's and I'm sure I've said it backwards, <laughs> but thank you for understanding. <laughs> so is there, let's give any opposition a minute or two to call in. And if not, we'll just move into a uh, discussion and, and vote. We do not have any calls. Okay. So we'll close the public hearing and, um, you know, like I said, I, I read through these materials and I was hard pressed to see why uh, why uh, a variance wasn't appropriate. So um, anybody else want to weigh in? I know Ms. Karpinek has. Well, I'll make a motion. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Lawless. I was, I was just, no, actually, I thought it was Mr. L I thought it was Someone else that had the hand up. I didn't. I'm going to second okay. your motion when you make it. So okay, uh, well, I'll make a motion that we approve the uh, after the uh, variance, and I'll second it. Okay, so we'll take a vote. Uh, Ms. Davis, how do you vote? In favor. Ms. Carpenter. Well, I vote in favor, but I think it's an item D request. Maybe we can get clarification. From zoning department, it is an item D. So the the standard is that the uh, there's no increase in the degree of nonconformity. Okay, so I'll uh, amend my motion that uh, 
we approve this as an item D because there is no increase in the nonconformity. And I'll second that. Okay, Ms. Davis. In favor. Uh, Ms. Karpinek. In favor. Mr. Lawless. In favor. Mr. Newton. In favor. And I'm in favor, so that mo that passes. Next case. Uh, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair. Yes. If I can make a request, when you're after you've made the roll call for vote, if you could right. just announce to me what the actual numbers are, because like it's four to one or five to zero, okay. because we're getting some cutouts over here. Okay. So that will help. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, and I'll tell you the last one, two, three, four, five have been five in favor and no opposition. So thank you. And I can go back further if you need me to. Good. It just started happening. Okay. Sorry about that. I'll be sure. If I forget, remind me. Okay, the next case is case 2020 258, located at 101. Mount Chanin Road requesting a variance from the maximum allowable square footage for an accessory structure within an RS30 district. Uh, this, this property is an overview, the aerial view, subject property, street views and across the street. Here's the proposed site plan and elevations and this is a case where the permit was canceled by the zoning administrator due to the permit being issued in error. Um, there is a residential accessory structure overlay that recently went into place, which prohibits the 1,500 square feet that they were proposing. It would only allow a maximum 1,200 square feet. So the applicant is requesting a 300 square foot variance and they may go ahead and address the board now, state their name, address, and present their case. Applicant, are you there? Applicant, street views, and across the street. We're going to need to speak up. We cannot hear you. And this is a case where the permit was canceled by the zoning uh, Applicant. Applicant, we cannot hear you. You need to get to, you need to speak up. Um, Vice Chair, he has not caught up with you because he is watching um, on television, most likely. So he's got a slight delay. So give him just a second to catch okay. up. And they may go ahead and address the board now, state their name, address, and present the case. Uh, Richard Hardaway. Okay, what's your Montana. Are you there? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. If you have you your TV on in the background, Mr. Hardaway, if you could turn it off or turn the volume down. Can, can you hear you me? Turn the volume up on your computer. You there, Mr. Hardaway? I think he's still catching up to us. He just raised his hand he can and talk. talk. He can talk. Yeah. Mr. Hardaway. He just raised his hand to speak. <laughs> yeah, there it is. I can see his hand. Let me just call. I'm going to call in because it's not allowing me to hear you guys at all. Let me just call in. I'm going to call in. No, not this number. Let me call. God bless technology. One I think we're doing pretty well though. I think we're doing great, actually. Better than better than I expected. I'm not gonna lie. Great job, everybody. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm I'm kind of glad I'm not having to sit up straight in my chair, <laughs> at least while we're doing this. Um 
We, we can't tell when you're sleeping this way. Well, now be nice. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, I don't get the dirty looks from Ashanti when she gets mad at me. Hello. He is calling in right now. Give us just, just a second. Okay. Perfect. I think our technology is tired. Oh, it's yeah, it's, it's terrible. <laughs> Am I on? You're on, Mr. Hardaway, and you've got uh, five minutes, and you'll have five All minutes right. on rebuttal. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, I just trying to get this garage built, and I was calling me get some. I need to get the approval. Uh, this bill that passed right in January and the overlay has basically caused hardship on me due to the fact that when I bought this house in the deed, I was able to to build a property. I just bought it a year and a half ago. I've remodeled the whole inside, painted the outside. You've got pictures. I've done a lot of work to the house, and I just wasn't ready for the garage situation, so I wasn't on top of it as fast as I should have been because the bill that got passed has kept me from doing what I wanted to do. So, Mr. Hardaway, do you do you have any do you have any hardship other than the overlay passing? Uh, the only other hardship would be the fact that I want to keep my stuff inside an enclosed area. You know, I got a lot. We got a lot of theft in the neighborhood. I've had people uh, come on get on our property, go in our cars. I've got surveillance around there. I've just got stuff that I would, you know, I would like to put into to a storage area on my property. I mean, that's basically, you know, I thought that was like private land rights of an owner that you could do such a thing. And that's the whole reason I bought in this neighborhood was able to do such. And it just kind of put a damper on things. So it, it, I don't, it just puts a, I just don't like it. So I would, I would like for you guys to give me the extra 300 square foot. And let's get it done. Okay. Thank you, sir. Any questions for the applicant, Mr. Hardaway, the appellant, Mr. Hardaway? Sorry. This is Mr. Newton. Mr. Hardaway, um, do you have uh, any, any idea? Because the, the permit was issued at one point. Was that permit issued prior to this ordinance going into effect? Uh, yes, sir. Now I went through, I went through greatness to get this permit because of such short notice. Once I found out about the overlay going on, I did, had no idea about the bill 2020-151 that got passed or introduced. I had no clue anything about that. Nobody got notified of that. But once I caught wind, I got on the phone basically with you know the meetings and tried to get the overlay not to happen because of the neighborhood situation. There's nothing over there that's alike, you know, and go on as far as the people around there. People have buildings, big buildings. People have all kinds of stuff built in there. I mean, this place is old and built back in the 60s, continuing to today of all kinds of different stuff. So I felt like the overlay restrictions were a little harsh when they wasn't there beforehand. Now, had I wanted overlays and restrictions, I could have moved into a nicer house, into a subdivision that gave me my HOA restrictions. But I wasn't looking for that. I'm looking for the American dream of me moving in, into a nice home with an acre lot and have me a garage on it. Right. Be to right. It. But, but so, was the, the permit issued before the overlay went into effect? The permit originally. was issued on, yes, originally the, the permit was issued on August 19th and according to your website, the the uh, effective date for this overlay is eight twenty one. Okay, thank you. So that kind of, I thought maybe that got me in there. Now there is a wrong thing on that permit, but that's not my fault. That's the code problems where they put twenty four foot max uh, for height, which I don't need twenty four <clears> foot <throat> because my house is not twenty four foot. It's you know I, got, I can only go sixteen foot to the highest ridge line of my house which I understand those stipulations. And I, I, I'm, I'm in, you know, I will give the fact that you got some stipulations of how the thing should be built, which I'm okay with that because I would want it to look nice. So I'm willing to brick it in, make it look like my house. And so it's not just a big ugly eyesore of a 
pole barn, which is what people envision when you say a fifteen hundred square foot building. So I'm not looking for that. I'm looking right. for something nice that's going to cost money. But I, I, I sent so a letter. I'm not sure if you got the letter on all your, you know, what all I did as far as getting the permit and how it went down. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, I felt like I shouldn't be. I felt like it should be. I should be grandfathered in because in my deed last year when I bought, there was no restriction. Well, Mr. And I was Hardaway, to build that. Mr. Hardaway, you can you can still build a detached structure up to twelve hundred square feet. I mean, it's you're you're lose. I know I know you you'd like that extra three hundred square feet in the height, but it's it's not it's not the case that you can't build a, a detached structure. I understand it's not the case, but the case is I've got a pontoon boat, I've got a a lifted truck, I've got an Infinity XQ fifty six big SUV. All these types of things won't fit into your normal average home garages. They just won't do it, plus all your stuff that you keep in garages. So I got to have some kind of storage somewhere. And we got nice vehicles that I don't want just sitting out. So I need that extra 300 square feet. And what's an extra 300 square feet? It's really hard to do. I mean, I have the property. I'm still going to be on the setback lines I'm from the front and the back, the side. Everything's still covered as far as that part goes. I still would match all that. And still have room. And then on the side here that I've, I've talked about, I don't know if you see my diagram where these trees are. Now that that'll block up the whole view of Deekwood, the whole the whole side of that. Nobody will see that bar, that building, whatever you want to call it. The garage, it won't be seen by that whole property. And okay. it actually increases the property value on their side because. I'm the one planting the trees to make it look nice to be privacy on their side. They don't see the neighbor right next door to them. <clears throat> okay. Uh, anything else, Mr. Hardaway? Uh, no, sir. Okay. You, you'll you have some rebuttal time if we have folks that call in. So we'll take those calls. But before we do, uh, Mr. Hargis, you've, got, you've had your hand up. Yes, sir. I, I just wanted to kind of clarify the, the timing of events for uh, for the members. Um, Please do. Yeah. Our, our office our office did issue a building permit to Mr. Hardaway. Uh, it was issued in error, and the error comes in that, and Mr. Hardaway is testifying uh, correctly, in that the bill itself was passed by the council uh, and became effective, and, and when I say effective, signed by the mayor, become law. Uh, August the um, 21st, we issued the building permit on August the 19th. However, the the, the actual pending ordinance doctrine, uh, which you, you all may be aware of, is, is where we should be enforcing this new zoning regulation. And that date was July 23rd. Uh, so that is why once our office discovered that we should not have issued the permit, we revoked it and notified uh, Mr. Hardaway of the error and, and offered him a right to appeal before this board. So just for a reminder of the board and the public, uh, there's a pending ordinance doctrine that the Supreme Court is in Tennessee has uh, opined on that, that zoning bills which restrict land uses become effective after first reading of the Metro Council and any recommendation of the Planning Commission. So that's that date was July 23rd. So that, that was the first reading, Joey? It was it, that was first reading. July twenty third was when the uh, planning commission made a recommendation on it. Okay, uh, so, and it was published in uh, as it normally is. It, it was yes, sir. The the uh, our office um, I, I apparently was not aware that it had became pending and issued Mr. Hardaway's permit in error. Okay, so he had, if nothing else, constructive knowledge of it. Yeah. That's correct. He, and, and, you know, to the, to the lay person, they, they may not be up on the pending ordinance doctrine. It's, it's, it's a little bit convoluted. Um, <laughs> no it sounds kidding. like it. <laughs> well, that's yeah. misleading. Okay. Well, Mr. Argus, thank you very much. Uh, do we have callers in the queue? We do. Okay. Let's take those.
Okay. Caller, you can speak now. All right. This is uh, Sarah Hinch, and I'm at 318 Rising Sun Lane. And I want to oppose this. I mean, people were supposed to build, um, the reason that they originally did the um, buildings was people had cars and they wanted to put their cars in it. But I really believe this guy's got a business that he's wanting to run. And it's, um, there's already been somebody in our neighborhood that had, got approved with a big red barn that's uglier than everything. So, and lots of traffic issues because they park out front. So I just, I want to oppose it. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, do we have any other callers in the queue? Yes, we do, two more. Okay. Thank you. Caller, you can speak now. Yeah, this is uh, Larry Haggard and Law Hillman Councilman in Old Hickory. Uh, Council member, you're not coming through very clear. All right, let me turn it up a little bit. Can you hear me now? Uh, that's better. Can you state your name again, please? Larry Hager. 108 Caribbean Lane, Old Hickory, Tennessee. I'm the councilman in Old Hickory, District 11. Uh, I believe y'all have a letter that I see all of you to the board uh, about this situation. Um, Mr. Hardaway uh, was at the planning commission meeting and opposed it. Let me call in on a different phone. Okay. Can we have another caller we can pass through? Okay, can we, let's go ahead and take the other caller and we'll come back to Mr. Hager or Councilman Hager. I'll call on a different phone. Okay, we're gonna take another call and then we'll get right back to you. Hey, fine, thanks. You can speak now, caller. Hi, my name is Amanda McComb, and I live at 206 Rising Sun Lane. I wish to object to this for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but the way I read the, um, the variance or the, that we put down the, the, the overlay was that the uh, current limit is 1,200 square feet and 60 feet high or 30% of the house square footage, whichever is less. If that were the case, my understanding, if I did my math right, be around 938 square feet. That's number one. Um, I understand also that Mr. Hardaway said that he would not build it 24 feet high. Um, however, if this variance as is written were to be approved, that's precisely what would happen. And um, it would not be cited to match the house, although he said he was willing to do that. Um, I just would like, the whole reason we did this was to prevent, in the neighborhood, was to prevent rather large structures like this from being built. And that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome, bye. Bye bye. Okay. Do, is Mr. Uh, is Council Council yeah, person Hager? Another, okay. Another caller, but he has not called back yet. Okay. We'll take the other caller then. Okay. 
thank you for giving him, Mr. Chairman, and all members. My name is Abe Alassi. Sir, you're, you're, I'm sorry, caller. We can't hear you. You're, come, you're fading in and out. I could not even hear your name. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Uh, that's better. Go ahead. Oh, oh sorry about that. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, board members. My name is Abe Almasi. I am residing at 141 Eastwood Drive, Old Hickory, Tennessee, the Brandywine Place Subdivision, and share property line with the applicant, Mr. Harden. I understand that code allow him to have a 1,200 square foot of detached on structure. I'm thankful that the applicant provided us for review. As an engineer, I reviewed the plan, Mr. Chairman, and I am concerned about the request for the variance of 1,500 square foot of garage. My concern is that the expanded size would be potential visual innovation of surrounding property. As a background, the house currently has three car garage. Adding 1,500 square foot will provide about double the existing you know, garage space. Looks like you know, 1,500 square foot in you know, a garage is going to be a workshop. I'm not sure about that. And uh, going forward with this, I would have a question from the, uh, for, the, uh, for the applicant. And what is going to be, Mr. Chairman, the you know, uh, size and material of you know, this you know, garage? Okay, do you have, any, do you have anything further? Uh, yes, sir. You know, going forward with this, you know, if it's that good, I would like to know that, you know, uh, this, you know, material is going to be used on the siding, and you know, also if you would, the height of you know, this, you know, that you know, structure in the ground would not be higher than in the existing home. And time's up. Okay, your time's up. Thank you, caller. Has uh, Council you. Member Hager made it back in the queue? No, but we have several more calls. Yes, no. Okay, oh, and for actually, he just called in. Here okay, and okay, and for all those waiting, uh, we've heard a lot from 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 several neighbors in opposition. And I, if you've got something new to add, we're glad to hear you. But we we I think get the picture from the neighbors. Okay, Councilman Hager. Can you hear me? We can hear you. All uh, right. This is Larry Hager, 108 Chair Branch Lane, Oak, Tennessee. I'm the councilman in uh, District 11. Um, this overlay bill, as I correctly uh, stated, was passed on July the 23rd before the Planning Commission. Mr. Hardaway uh, was involved in that hearing. Father, when Mr. Hardaway contacted me and lodged his objection to it, uh, he indicated to me that uh, 1,200 square feet was not big enough. He needed 1,500 square feet. And I said, why do you need 1,500 square feet? And he indicated that he has his own business and he needed to store his equipment in there. And I said, well, you can't run a business out of a residential neighborhood. And he said, I'm not going to do that. And I said, well, that's what you just said. So that's where that conversation came from. This overlay uh, has several parts to it, and what Mr. Hardaway wants to do violates three of those particular um, restrictions under the overlay. One is the 30% of total gross floor of the house are 1,200 square feet. They cannot exceed one story or 16 feet in height, and the materials must be the same or similar to that of the house. Mr. Hardaway has a brick house, as I understand. When this went before the Planning Commission, there were about three or four different objections. I submitted a petition signed by the neighborhoods of Brandywine Farms and had approximately 170 signatures in favor of BL 2020-316. Bill Herbert 
was notified on July the 24th via email by me that this ordinance had passed and as such becomes pending legislation once it passes the planning commission. We have had problems with people coming into this neighborhood and building what we call po barns. And most people in the country know what those are. And they're building them 30 by 80 feet, 32, 34 feet high, and they're made out of just plain tin. This is a very established neighborhood that started in the late 60s and got built up until the late 90s. During the 90s, Brandywine Place, which is Deepwood, was built in the 80s and 90s. And Brandywine Point abuts us on the other side. I told Mr. Hardaway that as far as square footage, usually vehicles take up about 200 square feet of space. As such, I felt like the 1,200 square feet was appropriate and a, a big enough size that it could be basically a six-car garage if he wanted that. But he's not satisfied with that. So for all the neighbors in the neighborhood that have supported me on this overlay bill, I'm requesting that uh, the variance be denied. Thank you. Thank you, council member. So uh, do we have some more calls in the queue still? Two more. Okay, so um, again, uh, if you're calling in opposition, uh, we've heard a lot from neighbors and from the council member. Uh, please, if you if you got something new, uh, please share it. But if you don't, please uh, be mindful that it's already six thirty. So, Next let me call. go ahead and clarify some of the points in the overlay that might answer some of the concerns of the other calls. Um, the actual size, the thirty percent of the footprint based on the tax assessor number, the allowable will be eleven oh five versus the fifteen hundred he's proposing. The height is restricted to six. and materials is part of the on-site review by the building inspectors. And if the building isn't constructed to meet the code, it will not pass inspection and they'll not get their UNO. So any concerns about height or materials um, will be addressed by the building inspectors on the site, if that helps. That helps very much. Thank you very much. Great point. Maybe that will take care of some of these calls. One of the callers just asked that we note their opposition and hung up. The other caller would still like to speak to the board. Okay, put the other caller on then. Okay. Caller, can you speak? Yes, this is Susan Geyer, and the address is 113 Cherry Branch Lane. And I am opposed to this. We do have an established neighborhood, and that neighborhood, if you drive through it, you can see uh, does not have these additional large buildings except for one that was recently put in. And it will change the whole ambiance of the neighborhood. We did have a um, covenant, but there's basically a gentleman's agreement um, to keep the neighborhood the way that it is. Um, so those are my comments. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. Okay, is that the end of the call? It is. Okay, so uh, Mr. Hardaway, do you have some time remaining? Do you have anything to add? Mr. Hardaway, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear can you. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, we can. Okay, um, I, I would like to rebuttal. Uh, these people that are calling in opposing, what about the people that live right beside me that's emailed you in approval? Like Rising Sun is like way away from where you, you couldn't even see this this garage. Now, Abe that called in, 141, he's more concerned about the height and the siding. Now, the siding is going to be brick, 
just like I told you it would be. We can fix the siding, the issue, no problem. It'll be brick. You can put it in writing. The, the size matter, it has to be fixed on the permit no matter what because it's too tall. It can only go taller than the house. I know this. Had I done this one year ago, we wouldn't be in this situation. I wouldn't have no, asked no permission from anyone other than the code permit to get it done right. I wouldn't have to ask. I'm asking out of favoritism to help me out because I could have done this, and you're putting a restraint on things. I live right next door to a dentist office, and a bank just got built beside me. That is no kind of entrance to a, a, a subdivision by any means. These people that saw they drive through the subdivision, they do not come out my exit. And, and Mr. Um, Hager, referring to business running, I do run a business, but I cannot run a carpet cleaning business out of my garage. I am a service technician. I come to you to clean and do my work. I can't do it at my house. If I park my vehicle there, that's a different situation. It's just a vehicle in a driveway or in a garage. It's not doing work sitting there. So I told Mr. Hager that way back, but he is opposing, and he's the one that told me that I could overcome this if I went in front of the appeals court and get it done. So now here he is telling me he's against me. So that's not good. But the thing is, my private property rights have been just abused by the overlay because, like I said, had I done this, just Mr. Chairman, may I before. ask the, the the appellant a couple questions? Sure, shoot. So, Mr. Hardaway, this yes, sir, Mr. Lawless. Let me let me just ask you: Did you appear at any of the hearings as Mr. Haggard or Councilman Haggard said? Were you, I were you present in. and object to it? Now, let, let me finish my question. Were you present and objected to that information or that, that bill? Yes. Okay. So, I, I objected so the will of the council was that they passed this and the planning commission passed it, correct? Um, say that again. Okay. You appeared before planning. You appeared before planning, correct? Appeared before planning as in public. Um, the the public know. hearings. The public hearings. Yes, public okay. hearings, yes. Okay, and they supported the, the restriction that was passed by Metro, correct? Um, but the majority ruled yes. There was a couple opposing uh, council members okay, on there. That, 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 that's okay. <clears throat> whoa, 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 whoa. He, oh, okay. So it passed, and then the council passed it correctly. A is that a correct statement? That's correct. Okay. So you had your opportunity to be heard before those two bodies, and you were unsuccessful. Now you've come to us to basically overcome those previous defeats. Is that correct? No, sir. That's not what I come to you for. I come to you before because of my permit was issued because I was told in one of those meetings by a council member that if I had my permit before the, the final hearing, that I should be good. So that's what I raced to do. And he should have got no. that letter. No, okay. That but, but it, okay. 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 So I tried to. Right. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm done, Mr. Chairman. I don't need any more. I, I'm, okay. I'm finished with this. Okay. Uh, does Apple going to have any time left? Yes, he has a minute and 50 seconds. Okay. Mr. Hardaway, you've got a minute and 50 seconds left. Well, I mean, I'm just asking for 300 more square foot than the variance allows. And apparently, They've come up with a different situation of 1105 or 938 square footage. I'm not 100% sure. But I'm, I'm stating that if, if I can't get this and I can't build this 1500 square foot building on my acre lot that is not going to offend anyone that's calling in, um, that means I'm just going to have to add on to my home and build it as big as I want. I mean, just make everybody mad. I mean, you got my immediate neighbor's approval saying it's okay for me to build that. They've seen what I've done. They know what kind of person I am. I'm not doing anything wrong except putting my nice stuff into a building that I want to take care of. And I finally can I say that I can do that. Well, at least I thought I could when I bought this home, which now all of a sudden is throwing a restriction on me that I don't, I can't do it no more. Because before this overlay, I could have built that building with no issues. And we would have never, you would have never known my name. 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Hardaway. We'll, we'll close the public hearing at this point. Okay, um, discussion. I um, I will start, and I don't I mean whatever's happened with the planning commission and the overlay. Okay, it's happened, but the question for us is: Is there a hardship here? And I, I see no hardship whatsoever. Um, and it is not as if the applicant cannot still build a detached structure that's still pretty substantial in terms of square footage. So those are my thoughts. Uh, other board members? Is that a motion? I can make it a motion. Would uh, you please? I will second it. I will move. I move to deny the uh, application for a variance. And I'll second it. Okay. Any further discussion? All right, we'll take a vote, uh, Ms. Davis. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, before you take a vote, if you don't mind for the motion, the uh, state the reason for the denial. Sure, yes, good point. Thank you, Mr. Hargis. Uh, my motion is based on the fact that there is no, there has been no hardship presented by the appellant and that therefore the request for a variance should be denied. And I'll second it. Okay, uh, Ms. Davis, how do you vote? In favor. Ms. Karpinak? In favor. Mr. Lawless? In favor. Mr. Newton? In favor. And I vote in favor. That motion passes with six votes for and no votes against. Uh, thank you, appellant, and we'll move to the next case. Next case, case 2020-260, is for five properties along Rio Vista Drive, requesting a variance from a street setback requirement. Um, they're requesting a 10-foot street setback requirement within the RS5 district to build, to build five single-family residences. The, the highlighted parcel in pink is the very first parcel, and they expand down to through 384 Rio Vista. There are five properties. By, uh, owned by the same developer. There's an aerial view. Existing site conditions, street view and the view across the road. I have included the site plans for all five uh, parcels, um, but they all, I believe, have the exact same footprint and the exact same um, street step back shown. So I'll go through these slides and then the uh, appellant will be able to address the board by saying their name, address, and presenting their case. So we'll go through um, these additional slides. But like I said, it, it looks like the proposed development is the exact same for all five parcels. Okay, is the appellant ready? Can you hear me? We can hear you. If you could state your name and address. Yes, this is uh, Jason Cleave. 3339 Hamberton Circle, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Um, okay. Asking for a, yeah, asking for a 10 foot setback um, on this. Um, just to kind of give you a little background on this, this was already approved on October 29th, 2018. Um, at that time, unfortunately, we worked on getting water lines put in and all that put in, as well as um, some other work being done. And at that time, well, we had some issues getting that water in. A long story short, um, we put in for our permits on August of 2020, and we were denied one day after our variance was approved. Um, already done this. So we've done everything. We've got plans. Everything has already been started on this. Um, <clears throat> that being said, um, it's just our building envelope. We just don't have enough space there because uh, storm water, we have a 75-foot setback on the back side with a bluff line. So there's just not enough space there. Okay. So that's Thank why we're you. asking for the 10 foot. Yeah. Okay. Keep it short and simple for you guys. Well, we appreciate that. Uh, did any board members have any questions for me? And Mr. just a little Please. extra. Yeah, Bill, uh, Bill Pride more also. Okay, uh, we will. 
I was just going to say the the council councilwoman Tanya Hancock uh, boarded us and said she was going to send a letter. I don't know if she did or not. And uh, also Bill Pridemore, but he's not a councilman anymore either. So. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, yep. Uh, do we have any callers? We do not. Okay. So we will uh, close the public hearing and discuss. You know, it looks to me like the, uh, I, I sure see a hardship here with this um, uh, flood way in the back, but I uh, certainly want to hear from everybody else. It, it seems to me like a hardship. This is Mr. Newton, I would agree. Um, and th there is uh, support from Council Member Hancock in our, in our packet. So if you make a motion, I'd probably second that. Okay, uh, I would. I will make a motion uh, that we, uh, that there is a hardship uh, with respect to the floodway in the back of this, this property and that we therefore approve the uh, variance in the application. And I will second that. This is Mr. Newton. Okay, uh, we'll take a vote. Ms. Davis? In favor. Ms. Karpinek? In favor. Mr. Lawless? In favor. Mr. Newton? In favor. And I'm in favor. That vote passes six votes in favor and no votes against. Uh, okay, good luck, Appellant. Thank you for the uh, brief and effective presentation. Thank you, board. Okay, the final okay. case is a short-term rental case, case 2020-254, which is an item A appeal challenging the zoning administrator's denial of a short-term rental permit. Uh, the appellant operated after the issued short-term rental permit expired within the R6 district. This property um, is actually a apartment complex development with a historic home in the center and there's the street view of the actual property and i will read the case details since mac is not available at this moment um, on december 19th 2019 the permit expired Mac's here if you'd like um, i'll go ahead and read through it since we've started um, okay. nine, and so on 1219 the permit expired in 2019 the notice of violation was sent on september 24th 2020 um, on October 13th, 2020, um, the permit renewal documentation was received by the zoning department. It was received nine months and 26 days after the expiration um, of the 30 day grace period. On October 19th, the website ad was changed to a 30 night minimum stay. So they were changing it from a short term to a long term rental. Um, October 23rd, the letter of expiration sent and the renew pay renewal payment check was returned. October 22nd, a BZA uh, appeal was filed, and that there were nine documented stays after the permit expired, one of which was in October of 2020. Um, and there were no documented complaints filed against this property. The applicant can now address the board by stating their name, address, and presenting their case. Yes, ma'am, thank you. My name is Matthew, P <clears throat> Matthew Pierce, and uh, I'm here as a representative of the Clear Blue Company. Uh, the our address is 1921 Greenwood Avenue, Nashville, Tennessee, 37206. Um, so basically, we had a third party property manager operate this property for us since we purchased the apartment complex and house uh, at the beginning of 2016. The house has served mostly as an amenity for our residents, allowing friends and family uh, just a place to stay that is kind of close to the apartments and has large common areas for everyone to use. Uh, after several years of operation, our company took over management of uh, the short-term rental only uh, last December under the assumption that any permitting had been taken care of and all notices would be forwarded along. Uh, unfortunately, this was not the case and without our knowledge, the permanent lapse. Um, <clears throat> we're here just first to apologize tell you that it wasn't our intention to uh, miss a step like this. Um, and second, to ask that the SCR permit be renewed immediately um, so that we can begin allowing residents to use the property again. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, I'm assuming, do we have any callers on this case? I'm assuming we don't. We do not. Okay. When did, uh, when did the permit expire, by the way? Is that directed to me, sir? Oh, no, that was to... Uh, the permit was expired on... Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, Vice Chairman, the permit expired on December the 19th of 2019. And there were nine documented stays after the permit expired? That's correct, yes, sir. And then the notice was sent... When was the notice that it, it, it expired? When was that sent? Was that September 24th? That was dated... Uh, um, October the 23rd, 2020. Uh, my assumption is the appellant um, was already made aware of the situation before the letter was mailed, though, because the appeal was filed the day before that. Okay. What I'm trying to figure out is, is was there, were the, were there any documented stays after the uh, appellant should have received notice that the permit was expired? It's very difficult to determine because the website was changed from a 30-night minimum, um, or excuse me, from uh, short-term to a 30-night minimum, which takes it into long-term rental. And that was on October the 19th, so it's only one um, documented stay in October, which very well may have fallen under the long-term rental. Okay. Okay, so uh, I've got it. Is the appellant still there? Yes, sir. Were there any, uh, did you rent it as a short-term rental after you received notice of the expiration? No, sir. So what were the doc non-documented stays? They were either before you received notice or that were they long-term rentals? Yes, sir. My understanding is that they were all before we received any notice. And that was kind of the crux of it is, is all of these notices were going to the previous manager. And who was that? That was not Clear Blue. Uh, no, sir. That was uh, it was a I think a subsidiary of Brookside Properties. Good cheer stays. Okay. Is that company related to Clear Blue in any way, or did you just buy? Did your company just buy this property outright? Uh, it's not related to our company as at all. It's a third party property manager. Just uh, Brookside Properties manages several of our apartment complexes, and they have a, a short-term rental property management group within there. Okay, all right, thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. uh, does anybody on the board have any questions for the uh, appellant? Okay, being none, we'll close the public hearing. Uh, board members, uh, any thoughts? Uh, Ms. Karpinek? Yes. Um... This is very, um, a beautiful property is what I wanted to say. And also, um, and you'll have to excuse us, it's really late. Um, I'm reading a letter of support from Councilman Withers who has not historically supported the BZA on exercising um, flexibility in our judgments. Um, and he says, I support the board exercising whatever flexibility is available to you for this permit renewal appeal must have arisen from an oversight leading to a failure to renew the permit. Um, so that's compelling to me. And um, I was glad to read that. So I'm in favor of um, the appeal. Um, I can make a motion or we can um, okay. talking. That would be great if you could make a motion. <laughs> okay, I'll try. It's almost seven and we've been here. I don't know how many hours. So I'm going to try. Um, so I will move to um, say that the zoning administrator did not err and that we allow the applicant to apply for the permit on Monday. Okay, that was a uh, very well made motion and uh, I will second it. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, we'll vote. Uh, Ms. Davis, how do you vote? In favor. Carpenek. In favor. Mr. Lawless. In favor. Mr. Newton. In favor. And I vote in favor. So that is six votes in favor of the motion and no votes against. I believe that's our last case. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Everybody have a great holiday.
and a safe one on top of it. Sure. You guys. Right. Yep, Thank you. Good. Take care, everyone. Be good. See y'all. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.org.